Yeah. Trying to fly a midwater creature into one of those jars. How'd that go? For Dr. Bruce Robinson. I, less, ah, I Bruce. lasted less than five minutes before he kicked me out. <laughs> oh of my there. gosh. <laughs> Who is this guy? Get him out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just in my mind, I'm trying to picture trying to collect a siphonophore. What yeah. does that even look like? <laughs> yeah, I think it has to be things that are, you know, can smaller I mean, whole jelly thing can blobs. Fit. Yeah. yeah, blobs. Yeah, the dives I was mentioning were when I was doing an internship at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So we're all talking about the same place. We're talking about the same place <laughs> and the same re researcher, uh, Dr. Bruce Robeson. That's funny. Dan, what kind of animal were you going after? Do you remember? Um, I think jelly? it was a, I think it was a comb jelly, Tina Four. Yeah. Still my favorite. I still try and catch those things. Never yeah. have. Never have caught one. I couldn't hear you, Dan. What a what animal was it? It was a uh, Tina Four, uh -huh. comb jelly. I like their little LEDs, mm -hmm. blinky light guy. Refracting light. Right. <laughs> I like to think of them the as LEDs. <laughs> Blinkies. Blinkies. Well, like the ones on the station? Mm -hmm. They're pretty. They're kind of mesmerizing to look at. Yeah, they're very cool. We got, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, they're like just all over the place sometimes, and they're kind of attracted to the light. And we spent a lot of time sitting there looking at silly things like a gauge for hours and hours. but. Mm. Like have There's we seen any out here? Up to light, and zoom in, and you can really get good pictures of them. No. Uh, we've we've definitely seen some out here. There's a highlight on the Nautilus Live website of a neon green Tina Four. That's quite spectacular. I think that was actually from Papahana Makuakea Marine National Monument. But they're certainly out here. We just don't see them or don't have the opportunity to really spend time looking at them. I think I've only seen. There's uh, I forget the name of the red one. Bloody Billy. Yeah, I've only seen those like a couple times. One of the most horror film common names. <laughs> <laughs> Dijana, what were you um, studying at Embury? Oh, um, I, w I was actually the communications intern. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out to on many different uh, expeditions with different teams to document their work so that I could translate it for the general public. So you were studying the humans. Yes. <laughs> so um, midwater, deep sea benthic ecology at the cold seeps out there. And also uh, the chemistry group looking at methane hydrates. Very cool. All cool methane stuff to hydrates. be explored in the deep sea. All in Monterey Bay? All in Monterey Bay. Well, the hydrates were off the coast of Oregon at Hydrate Ridge. Dan, you would have loved this. We were fall chasing bubbles to the surface. Oh, yeah. yeah I've been to Hydrate Ridge once. Yeah. <laughs> How fast were they chasing the bubbles? Uh, um, what's a knot again? <laughs> uh, <laughs> more math. A meter a second. Ah. Half a meter a second. A half a meter a second? Half a meter a second is a knot, yeah. Less than a meter a second. That's fast. Yeah. <laughs> a meter a second is kind of my default velocity of floaty things in the water. I think I heard the question come in earlier what, what the vertical velocity was. Yes. On Herc. I'm guessing by looking at the marine snow on screen, let's say we're going at 20, me 20 meters a minute. That's a guess. I have no uh, readout. <laughs> we have roughly 2,000 meters to go, and it's going to take us roughly an hour to get there. So, Spot on. <laughs> More math. <laughs> More like 30 meters a minute then. Correct. Bang on one knot at the moment. Did that squall end up blowing through, or is it still outside? Four, four and change, 5,000. You want to round that? What was the question, Steve? Did, did the squall blow, uh, blow through? Yeah, already? it looked like it did. We've, I mean, it's still kind of high wind, but. You need a 
need a, a window that we can just open up, look outside, and then close it back up again. <laughs> we got three of them. <laughs> Tammy has control of all of them. <laughs> I guess we kind of were already yeah. doing this, but this question came in. Um, hello from Sweden. I would like to know what the team members' favorite deep sea creatures are. One of my favorite is Rosia Pacifica or the stubby squid. So, Dan, is yours the Tina 4? Is that correct? Yeah. So we've I've got Delta Dan course. and the Tina 4. <laughs> and then the most frightening one is the Siphonophore. That's scary, very scary animal <laughs> for our RV pilots. We always think it's a rope. <laughs> Ropes can be bad for ROVs with spinny things on them. So Dan's afraid of Siphonophores and Steve's afraid of sea pens. <laughs> <laughs> pens getting stuck in the tube. <laughs> he always has to qualify that statement. It's, it's, a, thing. it's a thing. They disappear. Don't Sometimes it's cup corals that disappear in there. Sometimes it's uh, yeah, small it's a scary thing. twiggy it's branches. I'm trying to get them out of the tube once the ROV is on deck. Yeah. We have a technique for that. It's also pretty scary. <laughs> We basically take the uh, slurp sampler and hang it on the upper bumper, fill it full of water, and then slam it on the deck. And a whole bunch of science barfs out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are technical terms. That technique was perfected by Jess, Dr. Yeah. Robbie. I believe that. Uh, my favorite was already mentioned today, the Deep Star, yeah. Ooh. That's, what, that's my favorite I've seen in person. Well, quote unquote in person through a robot. Uh, although now that I've heard you've seen it in real life, Tajana, it's now on my. I actually want to send you pictures. I'm going to send you some photographs. Okay, done. Uh, and the other thing I really want to see someday through camera or eyes is uh, the barrel eye fish with a see through head so that it can look up through its head to look at siphonophores that it's lunching. Ooh. I haven't seen, I haven't, I've never seen one of those. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we've seen any on Nautilus, um, but Embari does have some beautiful video of the barrel eye. Well, it makes you feel any better, Steve, that six meter heave we took, plus minus three meters, was uh, half an hour ago, is that right? Four fifty something. Right. Anyways, I haven't seen any more. So might be, might be a one-off. I hope so. Yeah. Well, uh, whatever we can do, we'll just move shallower. Uh, if we can stay in the water, then oh, we'll better. Stay until it hurts. I hope. <laughs> we'll stay till ship change at least. <laughs> yeah, it did look like the wind peaked um, and has now dropped a little bit. So. The ship's also been shifting heading to get things a little more comfortable. Yeah, that's a I'm still thinking about my favorite deep sea creature. Um, I'm going to go with my favorite non-vent deep sea creature would have to be yeah. that purple coral, Victor Gorgia. I've really enjoyed all of the little slime stars as well. Oh, I forgot about I know. Those. They're just so cute. They are really cute. I want to draw one and make a plushie out of it. Oh my gosh. I bet Mary or Tammy could crochet them. Ooh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. That, that might be, uh, I'm working on a more stereotypical starfish right now, but I could <laughs> definitely change it into a slime star, but. That would be awesome. Can you like incorporate a slimy texture? I can spit <laughs> on it. <laughs> like if you squeeze it. Like right it. before I hand it to you, spit on it. Like there you go. Trying to think what you could like weave in there. Um, silk? No, like Some goopy. Kind of goopy? Slime star. What if I just stuff it with like that, fo like that foamy, like, Hmm. Kind of 
squishy stuff. That so that it feels squishy? Yeah. That could be cool. Now I'm wanting to ask my local donut shop if they could make a slime star donut for me, like <laughs> shaped like a slime star, and it's jelly on the inside. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that'd be That's fun. That's a good job. <laughs> Just saying. Logical jump from crochet slime star to donut slime donut. star. <laughs> donut slime star. No, it works. I'm more impressed that you have an on-demand donut shop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can I get one of those? That's not a thing? OK. <laughs> do they I'm do very gluten special? <laughs> huh? And will they make it gluten-free? I Yes. <gasps> I need this donut shop in my life. <laughs> Oops, people are putting in the chat their favorites. So we've got a fireworks jelly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Saw that. Um, <laughs> Halio... Halotrephes? Halotrephes, yeah. Halotrephes. Um, acrobatic snails. What? I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Oh, the Gaza. G-A-Z-A snails. The ones that spin oh. as they go down. Cool. The <laughs> yeah, I just had I, this picture of a snail doing parkour. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that. They get them going, they'll they'll just freak out and just kind of start spinning down downhill. Got it. Tammy, do you have a favorite deep sea creature? I uh, was hoping to get away from this. Yep, yep. <laughs> I don't. Have I was thinking about the nudibranch, but I don't think it goes when you're ready, deep. Well, I really like the deep sea soul. I don't know. Every time I see them, I get happy. There you go. Yeah. Were you on the ship when we found the deep sea uh, soul spawning ground? No. Oh, you would have loved it. It was like a giant cuddle puddle Correct. of oh. souls. Oh, the yeah. And, uh, Just want to scoop There's a highlight on the website. Hey, oh, really? Look. Oh, snappy. That was in 2020, I think. I think you're right. There's a lot of souls. <laughs> I'll have, to look, I'll have to look for that to check that out. myself. <laughs> It'll make you happy and bring a smile to your face. Yeah. Um, some more coming in. Uh, blobfish. Yeah. Blobfish. I'm a fan favorite there. That'll do. Rebecca, did you share your favorite deep sea? Um, it, the slime star. Slime star. Slime star. The one and that we've seen, yeah. Hit, um, well, Steve. Our viewers be. think it's probably secretly a sea pen, but it's not a sea pen. No. Not a sea pen, people. <laughs> uh, you know, I've always been fascinated Wait, by that? just the, the metabolics behind uh, sea, sea cucumbers. Mm -hmm. you know, there's some of. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> What's your favorite animal? The metabolics. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Sea cucumbers. <laughs> sea cucumbers. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's it's what it's about the sea cucumbers that makes them so exciting. So how how do they live at some of the deepest depths on Earth, eating the most carbon, you know, poor food supplies probably on Earth, and then get so big and gelatinous and then maintain their their mass? It's amazing what they can do when you put it through that lens yeah. they do seem quite <laughs> large for do, low yeah. nutrient diet it's like yeah it's like going through life trying to live on like blades of grass or something for humans well it's kind of like jellies too yeah but yeah steve wins for uh <laughs> everyone else is like it's a cute animal it's a bizarre animal it's <laughs> all inspiring <laughs> <laughs> metabolics <laughs> right uh -oh. Looks like it's got some fogginess in it, eh? Let's see here. Um, and Steve, they also can eviscerate themselves. Yeah. And miss also not having enough food anyway. Yeah. Like, that seems yeah, like a yeah. big disadvantage to, like, do that when energy is so sparse. Yeah. But I get that. I, ap I can appreciate that, Steve. Yeah, mm -hmm. I get that. Some more coming in. Scale worms. Ooh. Okay. They deserve more love and attention, according oh, to some of our viewers. <laughs> sure. It's very cool. Those are like polychaetes, I believe. Part. Yep. Polynoids. Like the polynoids. Mm -hmm. We saw and one yesterday, day before. We did. We did. And then, oh. 
One of our viewers says, I was talking about the nudibranch. A black tiger nudibranch was found by Imbari in 2018 at a depth of 1,733 meters. So there are deep sea nudibranchs out there, Tammy. Now I want to look up what that looks like. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, is that a black tiger? Yes. Have you seen one? No, I have not. Okay, you can kill the craft out there. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. But at that depth, though, that's really cool. Oh yeah, if you Google deep deep sea nudibranchs, it's like the first one that pops up. Yeah. I could crochet that one. Oh, <laughs> see, okay. <laughs> I want to before the end of this expedition, I want to link to your Etsy shop so that I can support your hobby of crocheting deep sea creatures. I feel like the Nautilus Lounge is just going to be covered in crocheted deep sea <laughs> creatures by the time this is done. Oh, that's really sweet. It says here that Herc is their favorite deep sea creature. Uh, <laughs> hopefully temporary resident, right? <laughs> yeah. Not full time. Those are great answers. Um, iron-footed snail. Oh, yeah, that's a very popular one. Got some fans out there. Whatever that weird tunicate is on our highlight video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weird tunicate. Which highlight video? It's the most recent one, it says. Ah. Yeah, that, that, those are uh, strange ones. If, if you've ever seen, like, the horsehead tunicates, um, yeah, they're yeah, huge. Like massive, massive balloons kind of on the end of a very, very thin wire uh, stalk connected to the seafloor, but they start moving around. Uh, actually kind of funny. But yeah, ima imagine how you know, something that massive and exposed to that much current, sometimes they're you know, a meter or more above the surrounding seafloor, is able to maintain position for so long. And they're related to us. Even weirder, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very closely related. I think they've always made our Halloween real because <laughs> yep. pretty bizarre. Very like a little shop of horrors. <laughs> <laughs> For those deep sea nudibranchs, apparently there is a YouTube channel that Imbari has dedicated to deep sea nudibranchs. So yep. check that out. Thanks yep. for the tip, Veronica just found it, but obviously I can't watch any of it. <laughs> we can't actually watch it, but yeah. we can bookmark it yeah. for when we get back. I thought there was deep sea nudibranchs, but I didn't want to say anything just in case. Just in case. <laughs> I didn't want to get people's <laughs> hopes up, like myself. <laughs> oh, there are fans like you out there, like, yay for the nudibranch. Awesome. Um, Four-eyed spookfish. Not, I don't know anything about that. Oh, Googling that one. Pelagic sea cucumbers. Wow, lots of people have favorite deep sea creatures out here. Mm -hmm. Pelagic cucumbers are really cool too. They are. Swimming cucumber. And then the gulper eel. We've yeah. got, okay, the deep sea has fans. Just saying. <laughs> well done, people. Well done. These four eyed spookfish look crazy. Did you look them up right now? Yeah. I'm going to look at your monitor. <laughs> Oh, wrong monitor. Uh, oh, no right monitor. Oh, yeah. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's take a look. Ooh. Oh. We saw them. <laughs> the page must have opened at the same time. <laughs> oh, and there's my favorite, the barrel eye. Yeah, they're, uh, they're freaky. Ooh. So they don't have four eyes. It's there. Are they fake eyes or are they other sensors? I know. I want more information. 
click something, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Corner oh, points upward. What? Let's see. It says that Spookfish looks like it has four eyes. In fact, it only has two, each of which is split into two connected parts. Oh, One and a half Jordan points screen? upwards, <laughs> giving the Spookfish a view of the ocean and potential food above. The other half, which looks like a bump on the side of the fish's head, points down. Whoa. <laughs> okay, yes, Spookfish has the world's strangest eyes. Photographs looking down on the live fish produced eye shine. I don't think I've heard that or seen that phrase before. Oh. Weird. Learn something new every day. We're doing pretty good with all these uh, incoming deep sea faves. I'm pretty impressed. Oh, we got sea pigs. I mean, I knew sea that pigs. I was waiting for that one to come. The sea pigs. Uh, Mariana's snailfish, worms that live near hot gases. Well, maybe you're talking about the uh, hydrothermal vent worms, mm -hmm. like Riftia, the giant tube worms, or maybe Rigia. I'm a big fan of those two, so that's why I said my non-vent favorite <laughs> deep sea creature, as opposed to my hydrothermal vent associated deep sea creature. Which is? It's gotta be Riftia, yeah. the giant tube worm, and it's because of their physiology. <laughs> okay, <laughs> how so? I mean, they're kind of weird. They don't have real stomachs, just a sack of microbes doing the work for them, making sure they get energy What's from that? chemicals in the water. It's, yeah, what is this thing? It's kind of cool. Oh, what is that? Looks like a siphonophore. Siphonophore, yeah. Ah. but contracted, maybe? All right. Yep. They break up all the time, too. So sometimes they'll break up and then reform separate colonies. I was just going to ask. They're colonies, right? Yeah. Oh, I like this question. What happened to our 3D map, Sam? Did you find it? Or did I miss it? No, we've got them. I'm holding them for some quiet time. Oh. But we've got all these great critter questions oh. coming in. The, oh. 44 oh. minutes. Anyone in the room know about the deep sea eel where the stomach comes out of its mouth? Excuse me, what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So I'm just throwing it out to the room. Isn't that what a gulper eel does? I don't know if it, its stomach comes out. Yeah, it's more of its jaw and hinging. I've never heard about that one. <laughs> We're not sure about that one. Oh, there is the shark that has the jaws that come out. No, that's not stomach, though. It's still jaws. Hmm. Is that the goblin shark? Yeah. Mm. We're getting to some pretty spooky creatures here. Um, Yeti crabs. Oh, yep. Viper fish. And the batfish, which we have seen. I saw a lot of those yesterday. Yes. No, no chonocops yet, despite uh, a lot of chatter recently. Mm -hmm. Chonocops. Yeah. Huh. Might see one. We're going to be in its depth range. Today. Yeah? Today and tomorrow, yeah. Ooh. Stay tuned. You might get your eyes on one of those. Hmm. A question coming in from... Uh, Probably a student. They want to know if the ocean can freeze at the bottom because it's really, really cold. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a common question. And right? uh, does the deep sea freeze like ice? The answer is no, and usually because the coldest uh, and deepest waters are usually the the most saline. Also, so that changes the, the freezing point a little bit. So you tend not to have. Uh, super, super cold water on the seafloor freeze. Usually freezing happens in the surface ocean. Yeah, it has to do with the chemistry of the seawater, so. 
It doesn't, but I can't wait to ask that question because we talk about the deep sea as being super, super cold, but yeah, it does not freeze. We are not in danger of losing Herc or Argus to a frozen abyss. Well, I guess it's things like gas hydrates might make it look like there's ice on the seafloor, but no, no. I guess technically that is fro it's frozen gas. Yep, so. frozen something. Yep. China cops. Lantern shark. Just as you were, I guess, hydrates, we got something in. Doesn't methane freeze? <laughs> we were just talking about methane hydrates. Are those all sea spiders? <laughs> Just to follow up on the um, ice on the seafloor, um, methane hydrates are ice-like solids that can form on the seafloor when methane, which is natural gas, combines with seawater at low temperatures and high pressures in the deep sea. So there are areas on the deep sea floor where you can find methane hydrates. Does it say where they're commonly found? If there's like a certain global area? Let's take a look. Well, there's lots of methane seeps in the Gulf of Mexico, and they're also located off the coast of Oregon. You can find methane, methane hydrate solids forming. But I'm not able to find a map. Oh, yeah. 
this is kind of an interesting question to explore. Um, some of our viewers are curious about the lifespan of deep sea creatures. Do they live longer, um, shorter? What, what can you tell us, Steve, about the lifespan of some of these things in the deep? Um, it, it, I don't think we have a really good idea, you know, whether things live longer, you know, like, kind of like a blanket statement, whether things li live longer in the deep sea. I think for the most part, we can, we know that it's colder, right? So metal metabolisms are typically slower. Um, and so for that reason, uh, they might live longer just because they have a slower metabolism um, and they're not as active. Um, but, you know, they also face things like pressure, uh, pressure, f pressure from predation. Uh, so things that want to eat things in the deep sea. Uh, animals are huge sources of carbon, and if you know you have predators in the deep sea, even though there aren't a lot of predators that ex expend a lot of energy, but you have things like squat lobsters that are standing on coral colonies, snapping at whatever goes by, and uh, you just don't want to get hit by one of those. But uh, assuming you able, you're able to avoid getting attacked by predators, you have a reasonable good chance of living for a long time, uh, depending on what kind of animal you are. So fishes are, you know, the large you are, bigger chance you have of avoiding you know being predated upon but um, you know you also have things like corals and sponges which you know provided that they're not eaten uh, or you know in some cases corals and sponges might actually fall over uh, under their own weight if they get big enough uh, such that you know they're not on a stable ground the colony will fall over and then usually they get eaten after that but there's a lot of pitfalls but assuming you do all those things you have a reasonable good chance of living for you know decades to centuries depending on you know what type of animal you are i wonder what type of methods we we use to get a like to get a number like that what methods do scientists use to try and figure out the age of some of the creatures we're observing and 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 collecting yeah, there, there's some easy quite there's some easy ways to do that, and then there's some difficult ways to do uh, to do that uh, for other groups of animals. But you know, if you're trying to age a fish or something, fish kind of universally have these uh, otoliths, so the ear bones that can be dated um, and tell you approximately how old that animal is. Um, but a lot of those things are uh, assuming that there's some sort of annual periodicity so that you know things happen on a yearly cycle uh, in the deep sea and in certain parts that kind of relationship breaks down a little bit um, so referring to corals and sponges um, there really isn't a very good signal or annual effect um, in the deep sea and it's kind of muted the more deeper you go so it's hard to you know say to take a coral and look at it uh, you know growth rings, for example, in a bamboo coral, uh, which is kind of the, the easiest one to date out of many of the coral species that um, have been aged so far. Uh, maybe black corals too can be done, uh, can, this can be done in a similar manner. But, um, you know, when you start going deeper and deeper into the ocean, you don't have this as strong seasonal effects as, as you do towards the surface. So, you know, there might be a, a food pulse that might signal, okay, you know, it's springtime because the surface ocean is producing a lot of food and sinks down and, okay, now it's about time to start producing your gametes. And then the coral will engage in that kind of cyclic periodicity. But, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's tough to tell sometimes um, if, you know, what you're aging is actually, you know, annual growth or if it's some other kind of time scale. But yeah, there's a lot of different methods. So you can look at rings and uh, coral growth, but you can also use more complex methods like chemical isotope analysis, uh, common for sclerotinians or stony corals. Um, typically, they will, uh, uh, yeah, uh, contain you know these different isotopes of carbon that can be dated. Uh, it also tells us uh, s some of the isotopes they take up tell tell us something about the environment they grew up in. So when they settled, you know, what was the climate like at that point in time based on the isotopes of different chemicals they contained in their skeleton? Cool.
follow up wondering we just kind of got a you know 60 second introduction to how we age organisms can you talk a little bit about rocks <laughs> yeah so steve mentioned um some different isotope methods and that is kind of the way that you go about dating rocks um so one of the geologists hey, steve, on board you, uh, she steve, will be looking at um the age of some of the volcanic rocks that we're pulling up using an argon-argon dating method, right? And so that's one way to do it. There's also uranium lead isotopes. Um, and for some of the younger stuff, you can end up using carbon-14. And so the science behind it is you have a parent isotope, um, and that has a certain half-life to it. And over that half-life, it decays from one isotope down to, it's called its daughter isotope, um, and so based on how much or how, yeah, how much of a certain isotope is in the rock, you can get the age from that. Um, yeah. Cool. That's fortunate that we have those isotopes that have a, like a time clock associated. Oh, absolutely. With that. Yeah. There are some other ones on land too that kind of activate themselves um, once sunlight hits them which is really interesting. So a lot of that kind of dating method has been used um, in areas where there are glaciers retreating. So you can kind of see where uh, throughout time the ends of the glacier have kind of been. Cool. Some questions coming in about invasive species. Are there any particular invasive species in this in this area? Or like the deep seas? I think just this area in general. The, um, uh, I know with the Fish and Wildlife Service, we do a lot of management of the refuges within this area. Um, the Pacific Remote Island Marine National Monument, so Cayman Reef National Wildlife Refuge, Palmyra um, Atoll National Wildlife Refuge. And so there's a lot of monitoring that goes on within those refuges to make sure that, you know, invasive species don't prop up there. What are some of the methods that the Fish and Wildlife use to kind of mitigate that? Well, I know on Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge back in two. 2011, they had eradicated black rats that were introduced there back during the war. Okay. A lot of that was baiting and different methods and such. And so now the big issue is the overgrowth of um, coconut palms. Okay. Which are, aren't conducive for the seabirds that naturally nest there. Oh. So they've been going around sort of hacking those down. Right. So... I uh, worked for my city's water department for a summer and we had this invasive species project where we brought a bunch of goats uh, to the sides of reservoirs and would pen them in, let them eat the species, and then just kind of move them along <laughs> as they were done. <laughs> I've always said, uh, if I ever own my own house, I want my own, I want a couple of goats. Yeah. <laughs> They were really cute. Mm -hmm. Got the job done. And just to give us all a home base on invasive species, an invasive species is any kind of living organism that is not native to the ecosystem that it's found in and can cause harm to that environment. I think it's important to remember that not every invasive species is injurious. 
So there's a lot of species that you know might be invasive, that, um, might be invasive, um, and not native to an area, but they find ways to sort of coexist with the natural habitat and creatures. Whereas in injurious species that is invasive, there's you know a lot of the native habitats or creatures don't have ways to combat against that. Got it. Got it. It's a nice distinction. Yeah. A couple questions about why does the marine snow look like we have slowed down? We're currently holding at approximately 2,000 meters as we figure out our next waypoint. We've got a yay for goats. <laughs> yay for goats, indeed.
Everything looks green. <laughs> oh, it was? Okay. <laughs> green looks good. We're still planning to be down for no. About how long is the dive supposed to be tonight? Um, uh, we're trying to aim for 20 hours. So that would put us at a local time tomorrow, 4, 4 p.m. or so, uh, recovery. Maybe a little bit earlier, depending on uh, how things go. Gonna have to make some minor adjustments to our dive track, but um, we'll, we'll see. see how it goes. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. The important thing is we're on the seafloor, I guess, or we we will be soon. Yeah, Steve, we're just coming up to speed. It'll be about 45 minutes to waypoint four. Cool. Yeah, so waypoint four will give us twenty four hundred meters. We probably need to still keep going um, to somewhere between waypoint five and six to meet that two thousand meter recommendation. But I'll let fr front row decide what their tolerances are. We're ready to start the dive anywhere. I see your, uh, some general questions coming in that we're happy to answer. Um, will the watch swap during the dive? The answer to that is yes. So you're currently with um, the four to eight watch, Delta Dan and the arachnophobe band. And at eight o'clock uh, Hawaiian time, the next watch will come on and they will be here from eight to midnight and then another watch midnight to four. And if they're still up again in another eight hours, we will be back. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Do we know if the other other watches have names for themselves yet? I don't think they do. Whatever We're it is, pretty it special. won't be as cool as ours. <laughs> if they do, our viewers will know. There's always a competition, but it's All a right. friendly competition. <laughs> viewers, please let us know. If you're out there and you know the names of the other watches, yeah. please Squeal write that the in the chat. Teams, yeah. We want to know. Probably not as spicy, so. Not as spicy as Delta Dan and the Arachnophobe I mean, band. We're, we are pretty face melting. Yeah. <laughs> and let us know if there's any other good gossip from the other watches. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good ones last year. Uh, I was on watch with Gabby, and uh, we were the 12 to 4 crew at that for that uh, cruise. I think it was NA 134. We had some pretty good names. Uh, what was my favorite one? Um, Oh, good. You're having the yeah. same moment I had earlier. Yes, I'm, I'm, I remember. You know, th November was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. It's Gears are turning, right? Well, you've got 15 minutes to figure it out. <laughs> the brain winch is spinning, but nothing is coming out. Nothing's paying out. <laughs> All right, we got a question coming in if we're the legendary watch. So maybe one of them is called the legendary. No, we are legendary, but we're oh, not that it's watch. Out. Legendary Legendary. Jake. Legendary who? Jake. Yeah. Oh. That would be another one. 
And then out. Oh, people haven't heard the chosen names for the other watches yet. Good. They, they good. think our, our watch good. name is going to be the best anyhow. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Only the best for the best. No. <laughs> they haven't done it yet. They're a little late to the party, right? Got yeah. about a week left doing right. science out here. Uh, Jake's watch, League of Legends, something about legendary or League of Legends. Yeah. <laughs> it, everybody just call Jake Legendary Jake. He'll uh, love it. Legendary Jake. <laughs> I thought Jake's name was Lucky Jake. That's what he told me, at least. <laughs> See, he doesn't he said even know. His, his mom wrote in legendary oh, Jake. <laughs> so there it is. That's official. Oh, we've got a former member from Dan's Tectonic Turtle Watch checking in and saying Turtle Power. Oh. Just throwing out there a little shout out. Dan has his headset off, but we will uh, relay the message. <laughs> That's a fun name, too. What is that? Oh, uh, yeah. Is that one of those like swimming a, sea cucumbers? I don't know. Any zoom on that? Uh, not when the pilots have their headsets off. Oh, okay. Oh, it's coming in for ah. us. Uh, I don't know. Took some photos. <laughs> That's a manual zoom? <laughs> that was a magic zoom. <laughs> oh. oh. We're getting love here for Delta Dan and the Arachnopho Band 2022. They're wanting to know when we're going to go on tour. Yeah, we got to figure out what our tour shirts are going to look like, you know? <laughs> we're not ever actually going to go on tour, but we're going to prep. We're going to have shirts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should be asteroids themed. Oh, my gosh. We'll get the social media going. It could be, like, instead of the little asteroid spaceship, it's Herc. And then we have, like... <laughs> You're trying to shoot, like, the sea, sea spiders. <laughs> yeah, the sea scattering layer or something of all the different... Instead of shooting it, you're trying to grab it. Oh, you know, you yeah. Has to grab it. We could make a video game. Man, we got it all planned out. We can. All right, who's got an agent? Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> franchise already. I have an agent. Should I reach out? Are we are we, are we doing this? <laughs> could have action figures. Oh man. You can just keep adding layers. <laughs> like would our action figures have like something special they would do or it would just be like I I would have like Um I think we should get those what are they called? People collect them, those like Funko the Funko Pops? Yes, yes. Oh, the, oh, the big headed members, one? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest, I've run out of room on one of my walls at home because of all the Funko Pops I've collected. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's Are they all Avengers themed? No, no. They're, they're assortment, so anywhere between um, sports to cartoons. Gotcha. Oh, another Funko Pop. Oh, another fun random fact about me. I used to collect Pez dispensers, so I have I still have a ton of Pez dispensers oh my just gosh. in a a bin somewhere. I haven't thought about Pez in like I don't know, a decade. <laughs> They're cute. They were really cute. I don't even know how or why I started. I think it was more like my mom and it was I was just the the excuse, like, we'll just keep buying them for her. And that would be cool. Gotta get the merch going. Yeah. We have people that are all about the merch. All about the merch. All about the merch. Sorry about that. I was just giving the boss an update on why we're doing what we're doing. Ooh. Does that sound like a plan? Like a doable plan starting uh, a shallower? Yeah, that should uh, keep us in the box there Kay. or close to the edge of it is where we like to live. Live on the edge. I thought we'd like to think outside the box. 
As long as we're in the box, we're okay. Gotta stay in the box. Gotta stay in the box. Don't stop living on the edge. On the edge of the box. <laughs> the lid of the box. <laughs> What's that? 11 knots? That's like super fast. The ship is going 0 0.75. Your your grafana is not refreshing. <laughs> Ship's supposed to be doing one knot. Wow. Yeah, we're getting up there. Yeah, all right. Oh, wow. Someone's built a Lego Herc. Been a couple of small bearing changes. I'm going to need the blueprints for yeah. that yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so that I can also do the same with my Lego collection. No, no yet. Wow. Ship is leaving us in the dust. So, the question coming in Have you ever run into a beaked well? on any of the dives. Not during this expedition. I think we would all know. We have, but we have seen, Jordan, can, can you remind me what the name of the dolphin or the well is that we've been seeing? Yeah, we saw look like a pod of um, melon-headed whales right off um, whales. the coast of Palmyra Atoll, National Wild Bridge, um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. one that thing you cool. want to watch while we're doing this, she's obviously going forward, but would be the angle of the wire. So if, if yeah. the ship was at a, a different heading, obviously we would be. Yeah, so I'd probably start closer to six. Yeah. It's it's not that far out. Ooh, I have an app for that. See who's faster. Mathematicians in my app. So if. Argus is at 2,000 meters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. And we can do this. Um, what was it? 250 meters behind the boat. What's the angle of the umbilical? Sakatoa. Sakatoa is your friend. The umbilical is the tether hanging off the back of the ship. The 6 8, as we call it. Yeah. Antonella's doing some air calculations. <laughs> Rise over run. Dan, you can do that math in your head? That's impressive. No, no. he's looking at his phone. Oh. <laughs> I remember, I remember <laughs> I failed math horribly, but Expose my math him, teacher Sam. used to say, well, you won't have a computer in your pocket all the time. Like, oh. Look, teacher, look right <laughs> <laughs> Who's your, who's oh, your no. math teacher? <laughs> Here's my computer Poor right math here. Teacher. So you're that kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um... Let's see if any of the viewers figure that one out. I don't know if they got clear what the question yeah, was. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> you got to give us the numbers again. So we have a, a wire that we call the 6-8, and that's, uh, that comes off the winch, and that connects to Argus, right? That connects Argus to the ship. And we call it the 6-8 because that's its diameter, and it's got... Uh, 2,500 volts running through it and a couple glass fibers that give us all this pretty video and allow us to push buttons up here and stuff happens on American Argus. So Argus right now is at 2,000 meters and we're towing American Argus through the water column at one knot, which is causing uh, Hercules and Argus, mostly Argus, but to lag behind the ship, or what we call layback, about 250 meters. So uh, the horizontal separation between the back of Nautilus and Argus is 250 meters. So my question was, what is the angle of the wire? Hint, 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 hint. It's single digits, and double digits is bad. Uh, I believe... You're not an SPL, though. I don't believe that to be correct. Did you get the correct answer? Let me see. Did we get anyone with answers yet? It um, might be too soon. Six degrees. It's coming in from uh, the website. We've got six degrees. Close, but no press. What's the layback? Okay. 250 meters. Yeah, well, got somebody He's working. Layback. So 7.1 degrees. meter layback. It's coming in through the website, 7.1 degrees. So. 7.1. We need one more decimal to win the prize. Okay, one more oh. decimal to win the prize. Oh. See what happens. Uh. But yeah, that's it. 7 degrees. 
Seven degrees? Yeah. Seven degree angle of the dangle. And if you look in our, um, what we call wire cam, it's the one looking across the back of the ship there, you can see a wire that is indeed at a seven degree angle. You can tell with your protractor eyes? Totally. <laughs> it's less than 10 degrees for sure. Okay, if I use the same numbers you use. You get the right 7 answer. 7.1, yeah. Of course I do, Dan. <laughs> so but I don't have a nice little graphic. You can do that in your head? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a trig function on a calculator. You don't need a special app for it. You do, because I don't know how to do the trig function on the calculator. <laughs> <laughs> I can teach you. I've learned before. I've forgotten. <laughs> okay. The boss is here, and I'm out. Thank you. Okay, so for everyone listening, uh, we are doing a watch change. So bear with us while we change out seats, talk about plans, get on headset, and we'll get back to you soon. Okay, Nav, what's the distance to waypoint six? Uh, and uh, ATA, because that's really, uh, uh, we're going to have to, we'll hit bottom just before waypoint six. I thought we were going to waypoint five. Yeah, that's deeper. That is, um, that's 2290. Okay. So um, waypoint six is 1985. We'll be a little bit deeper, you know, somewhere in between. Whichever the 2,000-meter uh, contour is there. Maybe okay. you could drop a target there on that 2,000-meter contour. So I've highlighted waypoint six. Sure, that's fine. Yeah. It looks like it was um, 1,700 meters. Hour and a half? Yeah. Hour. We can see if we can speed up if the bridge feels comfortable. Yeah, we have to be careful with tensions too. Yeah. <coughs> well, they they're supposed to be going a knot, but they've been going a little under. Oh.
Yeah, if uh, once uh, the yeah, once pilots everybody are settled gets in, settled, yeah. we'll see how that feels. In the meantime, I think you can. Let's see. Maybe that black line is the 2,000 meter contour. The sixes would be at 1985. And these are 50 meter. No. The white. The are white is 10, and then the black is 50. Right? Um, yeah. The white is 10, the black is 50. Okay, so that, yeah, that would be the 2,000. Yeah. Yeah, so waypoint 5 was 2,000, oh yeah, 2,200. <laughs> I think this is more important for now. Five is twenty two ninety. Twenty three twenty two fifty two twenty one fifty. Doesn't want to do it. Yeah, if we're going to go up that shallow, we'll have to bring the winch up a bit. Well, we'll, we'll um, stop before we get there. We'll, we'll stop wherever 2,000 is. And, or, uh, yeah, if they're comfortable, like I, if there's, it's a little bit less steep just above waypoint 5. Okay. If they're comfortable going down there. Yeah. How you feeling, Bob? <laughs> That's true. Here uh, is about 2,000. So that's waypoint six. Six is 1985. Yep. This shallow, oh, this is a slope. So the red is steep. So we probably don't want to land right on this wall because that's going to be pretty vertical. Yeah. Uh, It'd be really interesting to explore that wall, though. So if you're comfortable yeah, going a little deeper. It would better to be deeper. waypoint five, which we have, what, at 2200? 2290, I believe. Yeah. So that'll be right here. It should be a nice flat spot, good for landing before we head up that wall. But we've got a little over a kilometer left to get to waypoint five, and it's about 1,700 meters to waypoint six. And then we'll have sort of a flat area, head up a little bit of a slope at waypoint nine, and then there'll be another wall here up to 10. Yeah, and since we're ahead of schedule, you know, with uh, when we reach bottom, <clears throat> what we could do is spend some time. If that wall at waypoint six looks interesting, we can lateral along it if this ship is able to. Yeah. Uh, um, it can be challenging to lateral along the wall with the vehicle. We just have to keep our disc stepped back. So it'll be what the pilots are comfortable with. Yeah. Walls are really fun. That's where the. That's <laughs> where all the good stuff is. That's where the good stuff is. It's fun for biologists. That's that's where it's easier in a submarine. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> walls in the sub, you just fly those walls. <laughs> Especially if there's overhangs and stuff, you can just yeah. kind of scoot. Yeah, you don't mind exploring some caves, right? <laughs> Uh, there's different vehicles for different jobs. Yep. Some things are good at one type of task, and other things are good at a different type of task. Yeah. Upside of ROEs, you always get a comfy seat. <laughs> yeah. You can have your meals whenever. Yeah. Don't have to is pee in a bottle. <laughs> you don't have to pee in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Wins right there.
Though there is something to be said about actually seeing it with your own eyes. Yeah. Well, if it's, yeah, if the wall is too difficult, we could uh, lateral along right at, on the top of it. I, yeah. I don't think it'll be too difficult. It's just yeah. we're going to have to go really slow. Yeah, we'll have know. to go slow. Yeah. We have to keep Argus on the, away from the wall side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pull you away. Hmm. But if it's really interesting, it could be worth the time it takes. We'll just have to see. We won't know until we get there. Yeah. So we're heading about here? We are uh, proceeding to waypoint five. We'll settle down somewhere a little bit above there, maybe, mm. um, but before this red wall. Here. Okay. And work our way up. So it's interesting. We got terraces, two terraces as we proceed up this geo. So they are either maybe old coral atolls, uh, fringing reefs. Do you want to explain to our viewers what a geo is? Geo is a flat topped sea mount or table mount uh, that was once an island. There are other ways to have a flat top seamount, but most usually it's uh, something that was exposed to the, it was above sea level and wave action eroded, wave and wind and rain eroded the top of it, flattened it out. As the seamount subsided, that flat top sank below. Now so corals would grow up along it as it's sinking, but Eventually, the subsidence is too much for the corals to overcome, and so they die out. They're too deep for sunlight. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're left with this kind of a carbonate cap near the top of the seamount, formed from uh, the remains of old corals. Yeah, in the, in the wet lab, we uh, last night we saw some pretty cool fossilized co uh, corals, which is nice. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Might have to hold that a little close. I, I didn't hear you so very loudly, but oh, there you go. Is this better? Yes. Great. Coralie, that's a good point you brought up then because someone's wondering what happened with the coral uh, that or, oh. Megan might also be able to help with this one but um, the coral that we were not able to sample completely did you guys get to do anything with it that tiny piece we were able to get but couldn't get all of it because of its location um, a little fried, do either of, yeah, yeah do any of you have any uh, more information on it uh, well, we did process it and we put it in ethanol, and we'll we'll send it send to it Harvard out. and see what see what they do with it. Perfect. I think my favorite though was that uh, stony coral that we got. That was really the yellow one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one was really cool. It looks yeah. pretty fake. <laughs> yeah, it almost when yeah, you look it does, at it, it, it almost, almost looks real. Fake. Yeah. yeah. Did it slime on you? I oh. <laughs> no. Uh, sometimes they produce mucus. Interesting. There was um, what is it? The gall, gall, gall. It was like this bulbous part on the coral that Steve was explaining. Like sometimes when things grow on that particular coral, they'll they don't like it, and so what they'll do is their skin will just grow over it. Yep. Which is really strange. So somewhere in that bulb is like. An animal, another animal. Wow. <laughs> Obviously dead, but it's in there. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Our bodies can do that too. It's like a cyst mm -hmm. will we'll form around something that our bodies don't like. It's kind of wild how, you know, that's, that's the solution to irritation. It's just <laughs> uh, ball it up and forget about it. Mm -hmm. Just hide it away. Yeah. <laughs>
someone's wondering if we will be doing any more tests of new vehicles like Newey and Mesobot in the future. Uh, yeah, we are. Uh, we will finish up this expedition and then have a three-week ROV expedition um, in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument following this one. But our third expedition of the year will actually be another technology testing cruise uh, working with uh, Nui, Nereid Under Ice, and also the autonomous vehicle uh, Mesobot, and um, also an uncrewed surface vessel, which is called Drix. So we'll be having a few different, different technology and um, different types of robots on board for the third expedition. And if you want to read more about it, if you go on our website and go to Expeditions, you can click on uh, the page for that one, and it's our technology testing cruise. It's the third one. And that cruise is in partnership with uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and also uh, the University of New Hampshire. So, Herc, it looks like our speed through the water is about 0.7 uh, or 0.8. Yeah. <clears throat> you okay with going up to a knot? Yeah, I just talked to the bridge. Oh. Um, he said uh, they were having a bit trouble going faster, but he's going to see what he can do. Okay. Yeah, they're pro yeah they're going into the wind obviously and swell. So yeah. Yeah, it's been a bit challenging. Yeah, it's not a problem going forward, you know, it's just when we back down, the wire starts to tend under the back of the ship. It's yep. That's bad. That's bad. We don't want the wire no. <laughs> under the ship. No. Emil, someone's wondering how did weather influence today's dive? Yeah, it delayed it. Uh, we had some squalls. We've actually, we've got some uh, pretty large, occasionally you would get a large swell that's uh, close to t nine, maybe ten feet. And uh, that, coupled with some winds that would pick up during rain squalls, caused us to delay our launch at, at 4 p.m. local. So I took a look at the satellite imagery then and saw, that, wow, there's these, l these rain squalls lined up very nicely with these uh, arc clouds in the satellite imagery. It's the gust front or outflow from the rainstorm. <coughs> That Can vertical winds hit the ocean surface and spread out. Uh, and I so it. Oh, then when we saw that bad. we could see what, these what squalls on the satellite before? imagery, we could time it. And so yeah. we were confident we were able to go in at 6 p.m. local, and that worked. Uh, 39 but to 98 k. So that, you know, back this afternoon, the winds were gusting up to 25 or 30 knots. It's well above our, you know, 30 is well above our limit. Mm -hmm. 25 is about the limit. And... Um, now they're they're gusting, but only to 20 or so. Uh, and the swells aren't as bad, or are they still the, the same? Swells are about the same, yeah. And so the swells are uh, causing the ship to pitch, and that puts tension on the winch. We don't want to exceed certain limits for tension on that line, so we are transiting. So we're st we're gonna start our dive at about 2,000 meters, maybe a little deeper. Instead of what we were going to go to? Yeah, we were yeah. going to try 2,900 meters, and uh, that would have been a bit much with this with this sea state. Because that's a lot of extra weight, yeah. extra tension. Dave, do you mind putting up the um, uh, map? So people on Channel 3, people can see. Um, and we do know that Channel 3 is uh, not streaming at the moment. That is a shore side problem, and they have been aware. But if you go to Quad, you'll be able to uh, still see it. I'm, I know it's a smaller version, um, but... You'll uh, be able to see the contours, which are it, yeah. tightly spaced. So that's a steep slope, and we have underneath... The contours are overlaid on color representing this, this slope. And so the red is a very uh, steep transition to uh, well, a, a terrace, a marine terrace. So we'll be s reaching bottom just before that area and hopefully uh, exploring that steep port. Yeah. The 
Yeah. So we Someone's yeah. wondering if the weather is why the descent has stopped and we're just getting yes. to the next location. Exactly. Yeah. We don't want to we don't want to go much deeper and so uh, we stopped at this depth and are choosing a, another waypoint along our transit our track up the sea, the slope of the seamount just starting at a sh you know shallower depth than we originally planned. Yep. Yeah. I just got to have a plan B and a plan C out here. <laughs> We've yeah, run, run. had high hard. winds, we'll high swell, on. and strong <laughs> currents on this cruise. It's been an uh, education yep. of operating in the tropics here. Major props to the ROV team, too. Science and ROV. Megan, someone says that they missed the scale worms and they hope that we see more tonight. <laughs> we might see some. I mean, it's definitely a possibility. That one was definitely the largest one I've seen. It was super cool. But some uh, polychaete worms can get quite large, like bobbit worms. I think, I can't remember what the largest polychaete there was there's, but there's like one off of uh, England that's like 10 feet three, or something no it was like really was like more than 30 feet long. oh really yeah I mean wow. I believe it <laughs> it's nuts that's like you know stuff of nightmares it's wonderful yeah Jake or Bob if you have time someone's wondering what type of ROV modifications did you guys have to do during this expedition? I always wonder who's asking these questions. I am <laughs> not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Your boss um, wants a status update. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> um, what, what have we had to do? We've, uh, we've moved around cameras. Yeah. 4K and 4K's up on the light bar. And then there's the still cam on the porch. Um, we've done a lot to the arm, trying to yeah. hunt, hunt down ground faults. And it's, it's got a little twitch going on right yeah, now. Yeah, it does. Um, huh. Lights. Yeah, we've yeah. Moved, we've added a, a few lights, moved around a number of others, trying to find the optimal uh, light distribution. Um, I did hear back from Kraft, the manufacturer, the manipulator, on being able to do a fix I wanted to do. Yeah. So that's good. Yep. Yeah. So that should make it operate back in the mode that we wanted it to be. So a lot, you've done a lot. Yeah, so even with that high of ground, 10 meg, it's still the bender still makes it twitch. Yeah. Someone says, in the spirit of sending good vibes, I hope you find a whale fall with a new kind of giant squid eating it tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Keep sending your positive yeah. thoughts and vibes. <laughs> yeah, that that would be amazing. I wouldn't expect so to see something like that on oh, the no, like sea mount. Yeah, with a bender on. Huh. <laughs> we've had some really awesome dives, and then we've had some troubleshooting and weather situations. So all okay the positive now. thoughts are appreciated. So some whales have been known to use seamounts for navigation. Uh, oh, that's just that's just the current. Drag. Humpbacks in the oh, Southern yeah. Ocean, yeah. I think, yeah. have been yeah. uh, documented. To visit shallow seamounts, like up, you know, 100 meters or so. Yeah, the water keeps hitting that camera. <laughs> 
like at this turn. Flash pull, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Megan, someone's wondering if there's an expected time to um, reach the seafloor. Um, it's probably going to take us about an hour to get to our waypoint five, and then we'll settle out. So um, probably an hour, hour and a half. Thanks. Uh, Bob, someone's wondering if the winch has shock absorbers for dealing with wave motion. Uh, no, there's there are winches around that have what's called a heave compensator, and it's like a like a block and tackle arrangement that runs the cable in and out, or you can have an active drum that that runs in and out automatically based on the amount of tension on it. But we don't have that. We have what's called a traction winch. So the, the we have the yeah, that's like a block and tackle where the cable goes through and then the storage drum just has like enough tension on it to store the cable without putting strain on it. Mm. But we have nothing that compensates for heave. So that's kind of a, a bit of a problem because, you know, in this case we're, we're taking some pretty big swells and, and we're watching the tension on the wire and it's getting... Uh, close to our max tension. So that's why we're going a bit shallower. Yeah, the, you know, that makes sense. You get more tension when you put more cable out. And for anyone wondering what our cable lines look like, um, if you go on our quad feed, you can look at channel three, um, and it's showing an image of uh, all of our cable that's uh, on the ship that helps kind of bring Argus and Hercules down to the depth that we want to go to. It's like the ship crabbed over a little bit. The, the science of our cable is pretty complicated. It's like it has there's a lot of effects. So like the the tension, it's not a worry of the, the steel cable getting too much tension on it breaking or anything. It's because there's copper conductors inside, and if the cable stretches, it stretches the the copper, and mm -hmm. then when it relaxes again, the copper kind of does an accordion kind of thing, and it squishes the plastic. <laughs> so it's more of a worry of what's on the inside of the Yeah, it's of the, the cable. stuff that's in the inside. Well, and that's where our fibers are, right? <laughs> well, the fibers too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, we're, we're sending 2600 volt three phase power down the cable. So you Big need conductors. to have a good, yeah, you need to have a good insulator in there. And if you, yeah. if you squish the plastic, then bad things happen. <laughs> yeah, we don't want those to happen. So, yeah, it's pretty complicated. We just received a new 7,000 meter spool of cable in, in, in San Pedro. Or oh, home good. Port. All right, I'm getting a lot of questions on the cable now. Yeah. <laughs> it, it weighs, interesting. The, just that spool of cable is 18,500 pounds. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. the new, the 7,000? Yeah, that's heavy. That's really yeah. heavy. Now, how do we put that into the ship? <laughs> so we have to hire a, a spooling company that will mount the spool on a hydraulic winch arrangement on the pier 
and then we drag off our old cable by just like lowering it down to the seafloor mm -hmm. onto a storage drum and then we spool the new cable back on. But okay. Do we have yeah. to dry dock for that? Like how do you get this big spool out of Nautilus? Oh no, you don't have to take spool out. The spool stays in the in the winch. The drum. We just yeah. oh. it's, we just take the wire off of the new spool that it comes delivered on. Yeah. Neat. Do you have to do that all by yourself, Bob? <laughs> that's a, by that's hand. A, that's yeah. a <laughs> that is a big job. We just did that in San Pedro a few months ago. So. Well, Sounds pretty tedious. Ago, yeah. <laughs> it takes about six people to do it. So. Yeah, and you have to yeah. make sure that it lays right on the mm -hmm. yeah. with the wire. Yeah. So they're wondering. We have a little lump on the yeah. pickup drum right now, but it's down too deep into the spool that we're not going deep enough to try and do anything with it. So it, huh. it kind of gets progressively worse the more layers you lay on top of it. But. So they're wondering um, when the cameras, and we lost power of the ROVs earlier this expedition, is that what happened? Something happened with the um, wiring inside of the cable? Yep, yep. One of the high voltage conductors actually uh, shorted out and it, it shorted out inside the termination right on the top of Argus. So, um, you know, it's a mechanical termination in there that kind of squishes the cable a bit. But it, we apparently just got some combination of forces and things that hmm. moved that plastic a little bit and then it arced over. Once it arcs over, it kind of makes its own path. Yeah, we don't want energy to get its own ideas. Yeah. Well, I guess it's better to have that problem at the termination than in the middle of our cable. Yeah, on, we've yeah. we've had failures in the past that the cable blew through like that, like right on the very inside wrap of the drum. Like oh no. <laughs> We had to go to Scripps Institute in San Diego and spool all the cable back off, mm -hmm. cut off the bad part at the very end, and then spool it right back on. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That was another big job. <laughs> so someone's Were you wondering. There for that? No. Uh, no. <laughs> Kylie was there for that. She. Oh, it's <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah, and it's very messy because the cable's got. Uh, this really nasty lubricant on it that oh yeah 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 if you it get it on like you, you you don't get it off and Scripps was very upset with us for getting that <laughs> lubricant all over their brand new pier oh no <laughs> they made us clean it all yeah. up <laughs> I've been down in the hold to clean that winch and I've had to throw out my boots yeah my you just clothes, throw your clothes away <laughs> <laughs> everything you get you know you wear a Tyvek suit so you yeah can just <laughs> toss the whole thing because that stuff does not come off. Yeah, if you get it in your hair, you're... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should shave my head. <laughs> yeah, well, it's got to be really good at sticking underwater since we're sticking yeah. the cable in the water for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, we have a special lubricant applicator thing that clamps onto the cable okay. and it injects that lubricant into the inside the cable. It's like wishes it inside the the uh, steel fibers of the cable. Oh nice. Yeah. The idea is you, you don't want those steel fibers to get bound up. They need to be able to move mm -hmm. next to each other. So, so you don't want any rust or stuff getting in there that makes it so it can't slide past each other. I see. Can you zoom, about, zoom out a bit, Nav? <clears throat> see if the uh, ship is kind of being pushed over to the left. That's OK. We can just settle out at a depth of about 2,000, 2,100. Strands of the steel cable. Yeah. And then lateral over.
Yeah, it looks like they're having some trouble keeping their course. Yeah. And our, our speed's been varying between 0.4 knots and 0.7. That's quite a load they're towing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I have one more cable question. Um, someone's wondering, does friction between the cable and water contribute significantly to the winch load? I don't know how significant that would be. Friction. I mean, compared to the weight of the steel cable itself, like I said, it's, you know, 18,500 pounds for, mm. for seven kilometers of cable. I think there there is some of that, because you sort of get some slackness in the cable and then it has to, you know, move through the water as it tightens up again. Like drag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so right now we're moving ahead and towing Argus behind and it's back quite a ways from the ship. Yes. So 60 or so meters or something? Yeah. No, it's like, like 200. Oh, I got the... The divisions are on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's that big 100 up in the corner there, Jake. Yep. It's usually <laughs> down lower. Yeah, usually we don't go that far, but I had to zoom out, otherwise we wouldn't see anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, while we're still in blue water, we're getting some requests for introductions, so might as well do it now. Uh, I'll start. I am Kelly Moran. I am the communications lead out on this cruise, and um, when I'm not on EV Nautilus, I am the education program coordinator for the Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, what fun thing should we do? Let's see your favorite food. And my favorite oh. food is so hard. Chicken fettuccine Alfredo. <laughs> Sorry, Emma, you're on the spot. <laughs> Emma Patrunzio, I'm the uh, watch lead tonight. Um, physical oceanographer, teaching a bit, and uh, out here for uh, my, well, how many seasons? It's 2013, um, yeah. ninth year. <coughs> and. Uh, I like some of the Ukrainian food that, that we get here on Nautilus, the borscht and the stuffed cabbage, halupchi in Ukrainian. Yeah. It's uh, soul food for me since all my pa grandparents immigrated from over there. So it's a, a nice arrangement for me. I like the stuffed cabbage too. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Corley. Uh, I'm Corley Rodriguez. I'm a graduate student from the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. I'm sitting in the science seat tonight. Um, I have a lot of different favorite foods. I think a food that I can eat, even if I'm not hungry and don't really want to eat, would be corn dog. But <laughs> right now, the only food that I'm thinking of is Ethiopian food. Wow. Yeah. She's going to drive all the way to Boston after Yeah, this. when I get home, I'm going to drive she to Boston get to get some Ethiopian mm -hmm. food. Hi, everyone. My name is Leilani Sablon. I'm a graduate student at the University of Guam, where I am. I was born and raised. Um, oof, my favorite food has got to be fried parrotfish. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> all right, Megan. In the front row, uh, this is Megan Putz, your navigator. I'm from the University of Hawaii, and uh, the food I'm craving right now is poke. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ready, Bob? For what? <laughs> yeah, so this is Robert Waters. I'm the uh, Earth pilot, and uh, I'm a big fan of Mediterranean food. So. Mm. Nice. Greek. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jake Bonney. I'm in the Argus seat, and I would really love some Oreos right now. Uh. Mm. <laughs> 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 I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Every 
we're thinking about them. And you know oh, they fish? exist somewhere yep. on the ship. They are <laughs> somewhere. Kelly and I definitely saw I them come I definitely the saw them <laughs> get on this vessel. I don't know where they are. Dave Robertson, uh, lead video engineer on this uh, cruise, and I'm sitting in the video seat uh, tonight. Um, when I'm not on Nautilus, I'm retired more or less from the broadcast industry. I used to design and build TV stations. Favorite food? Anything with noodles? Ramen, Noodle. mm -hmm. Simon, Ramen. Uh, Fa. Oh, yeah. Anything with noodles. That sounds good. I have some Butterfingers. Jake. Went to my first ramen <laughs> restaurant. I could definitely go for a Butterfinger. <laughs> Earlier this month. Yeah. Your first one? Your first, first one? one? Yeah. I, yeah. 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 I mean, I've had right. the 15 cent bag. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same. But, uh, Not the same. No, this is really all. good. It was oh, a nice yeah. place in yeah. near Princeton Junction, New Jersey, um, oh. with the women's fencing team. They were craving noodles after a meet. And. Uh, so they, we found a great little spot. That sounds good. I yeah. love ramen. That might become a tradition. Good. Well, Jake, you're getting a shout out. Don't know from who, but they're saying it's legendary Jake time. <laughs> <laughs> who in the van is <laughs> Uh, it's too like late for my mom, so it's not my mom. I was going to say, it could <laughs> still be your mom. But it's very late on the East Coast. Yeah. My mom's watching. She's staying up. Really? Right. Yeah. My mom. <laughs> my mom's not on the East Coast, but she's also not watching. <laughs> <laughs> it's also too late for her. Looks like the ship's uh, making some good headway over yeah. to the waypoint. Let's see if the wind speed must be down. Wind speed's down to about 16 knots. That's helpful. Someone's mic is a little bit close to their nose. I can hear them breathing. I don't know who it is, though. It's because everybody's holding their breath now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared to breathe out of my nose, but then I'm going to become a mouth breather. <laughs> that or someone's just breathing really hard. <laughs> That's a good name for the team, the mouth breathers. <laughs> 20 to 24 mouth breathers. <laughs> uh, someone's wondering if people on the ship ever go fishing off the deck. Um, not in the monument. Yeah, we do not. Um, and we definitely are not allowed to if we're in protected water. So any sanctuaries or any monuments. Um, and we are currently in one. So And we have been this whole time. So there has been no fishing off of Nautilus. We go deep sea fishing with our camera. Mm -hmm. With our <laughs> Herc Zeus. That batfish was really nice last night. The last dive, never seen one before. Jake, your legendary shout out was from Hawaii. Oh. Yeah. What? My fan base is growing. m &Ms. Bob brought it me m &Ms. We're gonna share them. <laughs> I'll share them with the whole row. Yay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, but be careful, something. don't spill. Yeah. <laughs> Emily, do you want to talk a bit about the objective of this dive? Some people are wondering what we're going to be doing. We're documenting the uh, biology and geology of this never before explored seamount. And uh, we'll be collecting some geological samples to explore the crust content, the, the uh, mineral. mineral composition and richness in the crust. Uh, we'll maybe collect some geological samples that will help date the features, uh, date this seamount. Whatever biology we come across will be of interest. We'll, we'll uh, possibly sample some species of interest and get good video and uh, 
to see what it is that the monument is protecting down here. Yeah. How oh. far away are we from the boundary of the monument? Uh, we're a few, uh, just a few miles south of the northern boundary of the monument. I didn't look at the exact That's distance okay. there, but we're we're inside it for sure. Um, all part of the broader goal of <laughs> obtaining a baseline baseline data of the what's living out here in the deep ocean and and then uh, the hope of understanding those are illegal in here <laughs> where we can expect to find various communities I warn you. how they may be changing as ocean conditions change Tammy's going to ask who made the mess <laughs> I'm going to rat you out how these animals interact And all that's without cheating and looking at the dive plan here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. You there yet? <laughs> now I feel like a parent. Are we there yet? No. Yeah. <laughs> That's about 25 minutes uh, until the okay. ship is on station. We're going to have to wait a while to settle yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, it's better than it was. Yeah, we're getting there. So we'll be pursuing those goals from depths uh, ranging from 2,000 to 1,300 meters. <laughs> we'll have time to, we'll be able to spend some time at those depths. Oh yeah, water samples for environmental DNA analysis. So we'll collect these, we will use our Niskin bottles to collect water and they'll later be analyzed to see uh, if we can identify what is living out here just based on the DNA left behind in the water. Hmm. We have a good question about what did we study to get the jobs that we have um, coming from someone who's never been far out on the open ocean before. That is a good question, um, and everyone's different. So I highly recommend checking out our team page on our website. That will show not only everyone on this expedition, but if you click on the see more section, um, it will have every single bio of anyone who's ever sailed on Nautilus before. So um, it's a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, which we're proud of. So um, I highly recommend checking out the team page. Um, but all of us here are, are different and anyone, um, I'll go, but feel free to also jump in after with um, kind of what you studied to get out here. Uh, I went to the University of Rhode Island uh, for wildlife biology, but never actually went into the field of wildlife biology. Um, I started right after college uh, here with the Ocean Exploration Trust on the communications team in the education team. So I kind of took my love for science uh, and my background in science, but am now using it towards educating the public and educating school kids uh, about what we do. Um, so kind of utilizing what I love in school, but using it now towards um, helping other people get out here on the ship and bringing what we do to them. Anyone else have a school story of what they studied and wanted to get out here? Yeah, so um, in undergrad, I studied geology, um, took a couple classes and really enjoyed it and went to do that. And then I worked as in a professional lab for a couple years and then went to grad school. Um, and how I got into ocean science is because of my advisor. It's not really if I had gone to a different school, I would be studying something on land, probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, although I will say uh, I did talk to one professor uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and um, I remember him saying that, oh, like, I have a cruise funded, and maybe you might be able to get on a cruise. And I thought that was, I've never heard of 
that before, being able to go on a cruise. But now that I'm at the school that I am, it's kind of funny because they have a cruise requirement. So even though I thought it was so cool, I was hoping maybe I might be, if I go there, I might be able to get on the cruise. I kind of have to go on a cruise for <laughs> to the school that I'm attending now. And um, I've been on two cruises with Nautilus and I'm planning on going on another cruise, hopefully in early 2023. Um, for my lab mates' uh, research in uh, around the Socorro Islands in Mexico. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answered the question at all, but um, I'd never really, to sum up, I never really thought about ocean exploration or studying anything in the ocean, but I just kind of fell into it and super excited to be here. Yeah, what's the question one more time? Um, it was just, what did we study to have the job that you have? <laughs> For me, um, University of Guam is interesting. So we have one of the most diverse like coral communities throughout the Pacific and marine biology is definitely um, popular on Guam, but we don't have a marine biology like degree. So you'd have to get your degree in biology, which is what I ended up doing. But of course my classes were focused on anything ocean related. So I was able to take marine biology classes, um, oceanography and things like that. And from there I went on to graduate school. I wasn't, I was content actually with my bachelor's degree and then the pandemic hit and I felt like I had nothing else to do. We were all cooped up. I was like, well, let's go back to school. So that's what I did and um, ended up doing all my class, like most of my classes online due to the pandemic. But I really enjoyed it. I really wanted to try something different, like a different discipline in marine bio, because my job at University of Guam Sea Grant focuses on sea turtles. And although I love sea turtles, um, I wanted to explore fisheries as someone who fishes myself and also has seen like the detriment caused to like the reefs due to fishing pressure on Guam. I really felt like we needed more focus on that um, and especially from like local people. So that's what I went into and I'm definitely enjoying fisheries so far and I see myself doing it in the long term after I graduate. And the thing about Guam is, of course, we're surrounded by coral reefs and things like that. So deep sea exploration is not popular at all and almost non-existent. Um, so coming out here and seizing this opportunity to be able to do something that's entirely out of my scope of work to appreciate a different discipline in, you know, the marine world is definitely um, something I'm thankful for. And... Yeah, this has been quite the experience so far. Sorry, that was a long, long story, but it was a good yeah. one. Well, I think we're headed that way here in the next couple of years. So. Mm. To Guam? Yeah. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. You gonna go down the Mariana Trench? Challenger well, Deep? You can't go that deep. <laughs> <laughs> kind of parts of it. Challenger Deep? You can't go that coming deep. to your house. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom, bottom. I'd be happy to show everyone around. <laughs> yeah, I think they were looking for some place to like do our winter overs and stuff in Guam because mm. we're gonna be yeah. working. Come, that, yeah, coming you know. back to Hawaii yeah. it takes a long time. Yeah. You're not on SBL. When we get to uh, waypoint five, Bob, you comfortable just going down to about twenty-two nine, which is the bottom depth there? We just watch the uh, winch yeah, tension. Yeah, I think we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. So unlike just about everybody uh, on the ship, I don't have a degree. I have a high school diploma. It took me. All right. It took me three years to do a two-year community college technical uh, electronics program. So I had to take some time off in between to get married and have a kid, uh, <laughs> find a job, and uh, and support my family. But went back to it. Uh, I'd always been interested in electronics. Had my ham license when I was 14, uh, which was mostly to get married badges for because uh, I was a Boy Scout heading towards Eagle Scout. Um, but then uh, when I finished uh, at the community college with a certificate, not a degree, 
and uh, walked into a TV station one day. And uh, that was 45 years ago. Wow. I've been in the business ever since. Uh, I've learned on the job. I've taken many, many, many industry uh, classes uh, provided by vendors, uh, training classes on uh, specific equipment, general uh, video systems, that kind of stuff. And I've had the uh, good fortune to be able to design and build uh, several TV stations, big TV stations, uh, post-production facilities, small things in racks to go out on ships or to go out uh, uh, for portable applications. I've done uh, several hundred college basketball games, <laughs> doing replay, uh, video, uh, that kind of stuff. i worked for ESPN. I've done the uh, Winter Olympics uh, and have uh, and stumbled into oceanography one day. And uh, this is my retirement career. Now you're stuck. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> this is my retirement career. I, don't, I got laid off from my staff job when COVID hit. Uh, and then the TV station was sold and everyone was laid off. And uh, I felt lucky to be able to uh, go right back to, to work and uh, got to design and build this system that we're operating right now. So, it doesn't always take a degree. Nope, absolutely not. It does take lifelong learning, I think. Absolutely. If, if you're in the IT world especially. But absolutely. More and more disciplines, uh, you just gotta stay current because things change so rapidly now. Tom Friedman in the New York Times has a good book called uh, Thank You for Being Late, and uh, he addresses the, the rapid changes in everything these days. Uh, change in climate, uh, information technology, um, and yeah, it's just got to keep learning. Yeah. Speaking of changing in technology, um, someone is wondering, Jake or Bob, do the ROVs have any kind of AI that help in exploration? Uh, these vehicles do not. Um, yeah, when we have the AUVs out here, they do. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the our ROVs are remotely operated vehicles. They're not robots. <laughs> <laughs> People call them robots. They're not robots. They don't. They don't do much by themselves. They're, the only thing that's even close to any of that is uh, we have some auto positioning uh, features, like autopilot sort of thing, for auto altitude and auto depth, auto heading, and then we can do step moves using the Doppler looking at the bottom. But that's as robotic as it gets. I just started working on the with the University of New Hampshire there on the Drix system, mm -hmm. and it actually docks itself using. Uh, mm. <laughs> no, I love watching those videos yes. sometimes uh, of it trying. Yeah, <laughs> it's got lots of smarts. It knows so many things. Yeah, it's so sleek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do we have the video of Drix on, on our website? Uh, not yet, but we do. We did get a lot of footage from the last expedition. Oh. So um, the plan is to put out a lot uh, when we do the tech demo testing uh, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's a very interesting vehicle to watch. And Jonathan did some some drone footage from up above, and it looks like an America's Cup race when the thing is going through <laughs> the water because really? it's so sleek. Yeah. Yeah. It like you can <laughs> totally it. Yeah, it's super skinny and long. And it wow. just, yeah, it looks exactly like just a coast through cup. the water. Yeah. yeah. It's like faster than the ship. Yeah. It just zooms <laughs> all over the place. Yeah. It's pre planned or just you just you give it a it's course. Got all kinds of crazy stuff it does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it can like map the seafloor on its own. Yeah. You can just like tell it what to do and just <laughs> do its thing. Just let it Impressive. go. <laughs> I always keep an eye on it, but yeah. But we can, you know, we can release the Drix and let it go map an area we while we're doing diving ROV yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Didn't yeah. they say yeah. you can like leave it out for a week? Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And how deep does it map? 
The what? How deep does it map? Oh, I think uh, it's got a multi beam on it. Yeah, it's got, yeah, a it's, got it's got the same type of multi beam as the ship does, actually. But I think it's different frequency band for shallower water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's more of a coastal mapping uh -huh. thing. Uh, if we're going to come anywhere near the goal of 2030 for <coughs> mapping the world oceans, it's going to take a lot of AI and I get going. Yeah. We need more boats. Yep. Yeah, so that's part of our shorter the abyss program, is to be able to use the dricks in shallow water and, and then the ship for the deeper stuff. And then up close and personal with the ROVs. Looks like we'll be at our waypoint in about 10, 12 minutes. Yep. Speaking of the Seabed 2030, um, IFLS just put out on their Facebook and uh, I think YouTube and um, other social media platforms, maybe their website too, um, a really good video with um, Aaron Heffron, our mapping coordinator on this expedition and on almost every expedition on Nautilus. Um, and one of our uh, communicators who was out here last year, uh, Madison Dapchevich, um, and they're talking about Seabed 2030 and the importance of it and what Nautilus and other organizations are doing to contribute to it. So um, I recommend if you want to learn a little bit more, you can check out either the University of New Hampshire's page, but also um, if you Google Aaron Heffron and uh, see by 2030, it'll, I'm sure it'll pop up. And for our viewer wondering why we're not moving, uh, we are moving. <laughs> we're just not descending anymore. Um, we've reached a depth that we are comfortable at. And we are moving the ship, actually, uh, to a new location so we can um, get to the seafloor at a bit of a shallower depth. So we are moving. <laughs> it just doesn't quite look like it um, when you're watching the camera feeds. Yeah, we'll be starting our dive at about 2,200 meters or so, maybe a little bit deeper. And um, transiting up the slope of this Seamount, this flat top seamount or geo. And uh, we were mentioning earlier that this starting out at that depth because of the uh, sea state and uh, occasional winds that we're experiencing here and watching the tension on our cable. one of those billionaires to <laughs> build more ocean exploration vessels and vehicles instead of going to space. <laughs> you could say that. This side's pretty small compared to that side. <laughs> close. Yep. 2,100 a payout, but Argus is a little bit yeah. higher. It's just surprising. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's because that's such a it's just much a longer side. A little bit of, little bit of trigonometry. <laughs> that's all it is.
there's some type of glow in the dark thing. <laughs> it just went away out oh, of the screen. Missed it. It was a little jelly. Kind of got flipped around by our movements. There's a viewer wondering about some of the uh, man-made objects we found on a previous dive um, and what we do with that, if there's any protocol. Um, we do record it. We log when we see it. Uh, we try and record what it is. Uh, we take some video of it and take some screen grabs, some pictures of it. Um, but we do leave them on the seafloor. We don't pick them up. Um, but we do record where it is and what we think it is take some video and pictures in case anyone needs it. If we ever did come across, say, an artifact or um, something of that nature, uh, we also would again record it, notify anyone that needs to be notified, but we would leave everything on the seafloor. We wouldn't bring anything up. Uh, this isn't super relevant for the Pacific Ocean, but I actually read this paper. I think it was Turner et al. 2020. Um, but it was talking about how um, there's a lot of artifacts from um, when they were bringing um, enslaved people over from Africa and that they think there's a need to, like, it's related to seabed mining, but when you find artifacts, like, marking that area and not doing any seabed mining around that area because yeah. you could find grave sites or um, anything from any of the people who were brought over. So yeah, definitely, yeah. And especially with um, how many voyagers we're aware of that were traveling the seas, you know, so long ago, there's so many possibilities of different things that we could find in the ocean. Absolutely. But the ocean's so big. <laughs> it seems almost impossible. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I definitely need some uh, surveys prior to mining. Yeah. yeah. But then you kind of have to, like, there's the, the idea of, you know, do you believe that a sea mining company would would tell you if there's if there's an artifact there or not because you know on land I've had friends who are in construction um, commercial construction and their job is literally to look for artifacts and things in the ground because then you have to stop working and yeah. log it before any construction can continue and a lot of times they just ignore it so there needs to be oversight yeah <laughs> So the ship will get to waypoint five. We'll hold position there and uh, allow the wait for the uh, vehicles to swing. So that Argus depth of 2,080 meters is what's paid out, right? Yeah, it's, it's, we're pretty close. The payout is 2071 and Argus is 2066. So we're not going to like, you know, you're getting 2066 the from, not gonna send this, like, from USBL. Down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
Well, that was that's off of the the pressure sensor. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's accurate. Well, that's that's what I yep. I calculated 2065 based on 2080. And about 250 meters behind the ship. Someone's wondering if it's possible in the future for satellites to have the capability of high-res ocean mapping, like how we do. No. No, electromagnetic energy doesn't penetrate the ocean surface very far at all. Uh, so we've, we're reliant on acoustics. Well, <coughs> so we get a crude map using the radar altimeters and and now we've got lasers up there on space that give higher resolution sea surface topography. And so you can estimate ocean depths from that, but it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. It'll give you a rough idea of what's out there, and where you should focus higher resolution mapping efforts with our multi-beam technology. But it's not like mapping the moon or Mars with radar. Can't do that to the seafloor. So we get the slope of the sea surface from these radar altimeters and then you convert that slope to a gravity anomaly, and then you try to correlate that gravity anomaly that causes that slope with a depth. But you need some ground truth. You need some soundings, maybe some uh, feathometer data, single beam yeah. data, somewhere nearby to calibrate that. <coughs> but the, the, those radar estimates of the depth can be off by several hundred meters, maybe more, thousand meters in some cases, but typically about 150, 200 meters, I think, is the average, uh, average accuracy. And uh, David Sandwell at Scripps and Walter Smith with NOAA have been doing great work in that area. I haven't seen many uh, creatures in the blue water. Yeah. Going so fast, it's probably got to have your eyes glued to it, probably.
fast is a relative term, by the way. So we got over here doing about <laughs> half a knot. We're not going very fast. <laughs> <laughs> but we are like... We're just about there. Yeah. Yeah, we're almost there. I'm thinking once we, um, once he gets settled on that point, I want to move the ship so that Argus will settle out at our waypoint since this is the flattest spot in this area. So yeah. I might just have us move 070 about 50 meters. 50 meters, that, that sounds okay, yeah. And then Herc can kind of lead the way up the slope. Yeah. Zoom out just a bit. So what's the depth there at that point? Uh, that's supposed uh, to be 2290. 2290. Yeah. 22, whoop. Dang, dang. Clear. 
what we hope to do. Do you know anything about the difference in the permits for a sanctuary versus a monument? It probably is, it has to be stricter, right, if it's a sanctuary? I don't know depends. logistics. Depends, because not all sanctuaries are, like, not all areas within a sanctuary are no-take. Um, and uh, with national monuments, I think it varies um, that there's portions of them that are no-take. Papahanaumo Kokea is all no take. And yep. That's a huge area for no take. Uh, no, you know, no, um, no fishing, no mining. So it, it varies. But it's a lot of paperwork. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> The sanctuary is a bit more uh, guaranteed protection. Um, monuments are established by executive orders, which could be overturned by a subsequent administration. So, the sanctuaries are established by law and by Congress. Is it hard to uh, like overturn or like repeal a sanctuary status, or is it once it's a sanctuary, it's pretty firm? I think that yeah, you would yeah, you'd have to overturn the law. I think and yeah, that's uh, highly unlikely. That's good. But a monument is that different? Monument's a little bit. It's a little easier to change the restrictions. <laughs> yeah. Ships at waypoint five, and the vehicles will catch up shortly. Waypoint 5 is selected as our first starting point, partially because of the depth, but also it's a bit less steep than other parts along the track up the slopes of the seamount. So with the sanctuaries, yeah, there are MPAs, Marine Protected Areas, within mm -hmm. the sanctuary. Those are no-take. Okay. They're the highly protected. Where Where is it um, in Kingman? Do, do you know? Right. So since Kingman and Palmyra are part of the National Monument, uh, I think that that... That portion, that national monument portion of the EEZ is no take.
There's a good question that just came in on how will our research help future ocean conservation? You've got to know what it is you're conserving. So the first yep. step is to, first very first step is going to be to map so we know where to send the vehicles. Uh, we did conduct some mapping overnight and, and had a, a few passes over this dive site. So we've got good, accurate data to send the vehicles down on. And then uh, the vehicles take a look around and document what's living down there. So, And also, not what, only what's living down there, but how do these species interact with each other? How do the associates that crawl up on these corals and sponges behave? And what sort of an ecosystem are these uh, animals providing? But there's a famous quote from a Senegalese forester named Baba Dium. He's in a presentation of the UN, I think it was, where he said, we only protect what we love, we only love what we understand, and we only understand what we're taught. So we'll get, you know, this information that we gather in these uh, expeditions, there's a lot of educational outreach and great interaction with the schools. And so in that way, we'll be contributing to conservation efforts just by educating the upcoming generation of Ocean lovers. <laughs> yeah. Noah has an interesting program called Noah Guardians, and uh, it's partnerships with schools. And uh, is I give a presentation to four, four uh, classes at, at Lincoln Middle School in Alameda, Alameda California, uh, on ocean exploration. I know that school. Do you? <laughs> yeah, Alameda is like a city away from Oakland. Yeah. I know people who went there. It's right it's so on cool. the right on the edge of the bay. It's called Noah Guardian. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ocean Guardians. Ocean Guardians. Corley's like, I'm about to become an ocean garden. <laughs> ocean. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Guardian. <laughs> there are any uh, teachers or educators or anyone who's in an informal setting, like a museum or a science center, or uh, if you, even if you work at a community event or a community center, uh, we'd love to talk with your audiences. So um, we do offer free ship to shore connections to uh, any type of educational setting. Um, I will say March and a lot of April are pretty full but if you have any summer programs or um, camps or after school programs um, we'd love to connect with you so you can go on our website and uh, click education and then click the ship to shore interactions to learn a bit more about it but they are free uh, we love doing them and we will be hosting them from Nautilus until October so a lot of more months to go but um, I highly recommend if you are an educator or you work in a community center or um, are holding a community event uh, or work in a science center or an aquarium, museum, um, schools for the summer, happy to connect with you and um, bring what we do to your classroom and to your learners. But I will say, again, March and April are pretty full, so. Mm -hmm. I can try, but can't guarantee March and April. Unless you are in Hawaii, then we're good. <laughs> Lots of afternoon times in Hawaii time. Yeah. <laughs> but some of the East Coast and Pacific time frames during the day are a bit 
bit full. Oh, well, there's someone watching from Alameda, California. All right. Hi. I was stationed in Alameda when I was in the Coast Guard. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's oh. a nice area. <laughs> it is. They have that um, ice cream, <laughs> that ice cream <laughs> shop that everyone likes so much. Megan, as a marine biologist, someone is wondering if you have any aspiring tips for, or any tips for an aspiring marine biologist. Oh, you're not on SPL. Um, sure. Uh, well, how I sort of got into marine science was uh, just being really interested in the ocean as a kid. I would just, I just loved learning anything I could about the ocean. Um, and then when I was time to choose a college, I was looking for colleges with a lot of good marine science programs. And I ended up going to Ecker College, which is in St. Petersburg, Florida, and they have a really nice program there that uh, really got me involved into marine science in my first semester there, uh, giving me a brief overview of what marine science is, not just marine biology, not just dolphins, but a little bit of everything, a little bit of ocean chemistry, physical oceanography, biological oceanography, um, just to really see what your interests, where your interests lie and uh, get a sort of basic understanding on how the ocean works. So that's really important uh, if you're interested in marine science or marine biology in particular is marine biology isn't just about the animals, it's about the environment as well. So if you're interested in what we're doing here, studying uh, organisms living on the seafloor, for example, you gotta become a little bit of a geologist too to understand how the seafloor where you're studying was formed? Is it sediment? Is it rock? Um, what kind of rock? How does the topography affect what kinds of communities you see? And how do you predict where you might see these animals? So you're learning a little bit about geology and then also ocean chemistry and physical oceanography is going to affect where animals live. So if you're interested in, say, corals, you're going to be targeting areas that have high relief um, hard substrates, uh, high currents. How do you find these areas in the ocean? And that's where learning these other aspects of marine science comes in. Uh, really great way to start, you know, throwing yourself into uh, learning is to find an internship program or a summer program. And there's a number of programs like that out there. Nautilus, for example, offers uh, internships programs uh, so definitely check that out on our website. Um, if you're interested in ocean mapping, um, NOAA offers an uh, explorer and training program. Uh, and that's sort of how I personally got started um, in navigation is I started na uh, mapping as a mapping intern on the Okeanos Explorer. And from then got involved more with the ROVs and now I'm here. So internships is a really great way to, you know, jumpstart your career. Um, there are a lot of other ones out there. I think UNALS offers an internship. Um, there are some summer classes through Woods Hole that are available. So those are just ones that I know off the top of my head. Um, there's also scholarships like the Hauling Scholarship um, <coughs> that NOAA offers that can be really helpful in getting you into a hands-on marine science experience. Thanks. Megan, how often do you go out to sea? Um, it depends on the year. Uh, last year, I think, was definitely my most days at sea because I had a two-month expedition, um, but usually two to three times a year. And our Okeanos cruises, as long as Nautilus cruises, or um, right. I've been out on the Okeanos four times. This is my second time on Nautilus, and then 
Uh, mainly I go out with the Kila Moana, the University of Hawaii ship, and right. the ROV Luukai. Okay. So I can, yeah. I'd like to get on more ships, and I really enjoy going out to sea and doing this type of work. Um, I'd like to go out on the Felcor too. That would be kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it would definitely be a different experience from uh, what, I've, what I'm used to. Yes. But a great one. Yeah. And it's really fun working with different ROVs and seeing how they work and, and learning a little bit about the technology and the efforts that go into just having a vehicle that can reach the seafloor is mm -hmm. amazing. There's someone watching from Los Angeles and Oakland. Oh, hi, Oakland and Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Two places I've called my home <laughs> in the past. Unfortunately, not able to call them my home anymore because I live in Rhode Island. Not that there's anything wrong with Rhode Island, it's just really cold. <laughs> Jake's upset. <laughs> Jake loves Rhode Island. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it you guys deal the with the cold. Yeah. I love it. I don't know. It's, I don't like it all the time. The I like rain. it for like a month and then the, I'm the over it. The freezing rain. That's yeah, that part, part is not good. Yeah. But I do love... I don't know, when snow is falling, like, well, there's nothing yeah. like a good, a good snowfall for... When yeah. it's snowing, yeah. I like that. I think it's really pretty, and I've never been anywhere where it snowed before. Um, shoveling? <laughs> Hate that. Hate shoveling. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. We only have one shovel for our entire apartment building. <laughs> I moved back to Southern California from New Hampshire four years ago. Wow, that's a big change. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm from Southern California. Yeah, I used to live in the mountains east of LA, and it used to snow there all the time in the winter well, time. <laughs> where, where in the mount? Which mountains? Uh, Lake Arrowhead. Oh my gosh, my uh, my roommate from my freshman year lived from was from North Lake Arrowhead. Sure. She loved it there. Yeah. It sounds really beautiful. I liked it. It's just, you know, you got to drive down the mountain every time you want something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds tedious. So has Argus stopped swinging or is uh, it still moving? We still Pretty have a little bit of movement going on. But we are going We're down. almost there. Yeah. I don't know. If I never see snow again, I could be happy. <laughs> I wouldn't miss it. I'm with you. <laughs> 40 years in Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of snow. <laughs> we live on the coast of Oregon half the year now. <laughs> it doesn't snow there. I don't know. I love the seasons. Yeah, I kind of miss fall. I love fall. Fall is really cool. And I love spring. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, there's like a couple like days summer? when it first <laughs> turns into spring. Summer gets too hot. No, yeah, fall and spring are the best. <laughs> but like everything just looks so like green. It's yep. like this really bright green color for like the first couple weeks. And I feel like the first day it finally is like warm enough to not have to wear a jacket. Everyone's like running around in t-shirts and they're just <laughs> like, we're free. <laughs> <laughs> but then it smells good. Like like spring has like a distinct smell to it. Yeah, all the like flowers everything's are popping out. Yeah. Rhode, Rhode Island's unique because you can get, you know, a 60 degree day in February and then the next day you can have a blizzard. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that happened. That yep. <laughs> that that's was exact, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. That was upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, right. it's getting warm. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's happening just soon, here. too. Nope. In fact, I mean, I'm in Connecticut, which obviously is just the next state over from Rhode Island, but um, it was 60 degrees the other day, and uh, home is saying that it is going to be like 20 tomorrow. Oh, no. <laughs> but then go back to being in the 60s again, so it's just a fluctuating. I mean, it's, it is March, so it, it is normal, but... March is one of the worst months, I think, in New England because it's constantly it's just so teasing cold. and then yeah. cold, teasing and cold. That's, so one thing that I have an issue with is that it's so sunny outside and it looks so sunny outside and you don't really see any snow outside. 
So there's no indication that it should be cold, and you get out, and it hits Thanks. you in the face. <laughs> just like slaps you, earaches. Yeah. Earaches. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> I like just I just bought a hat this year and I'm so happy. Re honestly, a game changer. <laughs> you didn't have a hat before? <laughs> no, I didn't. Well, last year I wasn't going outside as much, so I didn't really mind everything because COVID. So fair. Um, but this year, I not only did I move farther away from campus, I also have to go to classes in person, and I'm doing way more lab work than I did last year. So. Yeah. It's difficult. You need a hat. Yeah. And gloves. Sometimes I, I, I need a hat in the control van. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm cold right now. I'm okay. Now that you said the hat, I'm like, mm, I have a nice hat down in my room. <laughs> it's much warmer over here than it is in Jersey. Oh, seat. yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy to be in this corner. <laughs> it's freezing over here. Yeah. Right next to the computer racks. Yep. I would definitely need like a parka to sit over there. I don't know how Dave does it. Socks come from Alaska to Hawaii uh, just to sit in the cold. <laughs> like it or not, it's 70 degrees in here. <laughs> 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature Where? doesn't. Right here. In here? Where you are. I, it is not. There's it no is. way. Yep. I am so cold. Absolutely. <laughs> 70 degrees. Temperature hasn't changed in three weeks. <laughs> this is a great thing. Yeah, well, my house is usually like 80, 85, so. <laughs> I think for me, it's just the cold. I think if the wind from the AC wasn't blowing on me, then I would be fine. But I have two ACs blowing in my direction. Oh yeah, the, the air movement definitely makes it feel colder. You know, you got that wind chill factor. 50? Can't help that. No, I know, Sorry. it's okay. The they're minute the, I step outside, it'll be back setting. to 80. So lowest, <laughs> lowest fan setting, too. It's so. fine. I'll survive. Maybe stop there and I'll get under and then we'll come right. in because it's, it's all up slowly that way. I'll start. Well, the winds were up to 25 knots about uh -oh. 15 minutes ago. Down to 20 again. going to be a squall. It's crazy how like it can just come right through and then it Boom. leaves again. <laughs> Yeah. Is that how Guam is? Do you get random yep. rain too? It could be sunny one second and the next thing you know it's drenched <laughs> everywhere. And then 10 minutes after that, sunny again. And then it's super humid. Because <laughs> yeah, everything's wet. Yep. <laughs> Alright, we're And once we set up, I guess we'll need to pay out, huh? To reach bottom. We have been paying out. Yeah, we're, okay. we're pretty close. You got DVL banks, it's about 30 meters. Yeah, you can start coming down. Yeah. All right, coming down. Oh, yeah, I just had to update my oh, yeah. <laughs> info here. Oh yeah, sometimes the Grafana needs a refresh. Yeah, that can really s sneak up on it. It does, mm -hmm. like yep. you don't look at it for a while yeah. and you just assume. Are we on target here? We are. Looking good in my world. Making moves. Yeah. You gonna go auto heading? Yep. Hey, you see floor. There it is. Sandy and flat, just like I thought. <laughs> That's 27 meters. We 
bottom depth at 2274, it looks like. Coming down. Lots of trails around here. Yeah. Cucumbers. Oh, yeah. Good landing spot, though. Yeah. Ooh. I guess the GUI got reset. Let's see if this values all back up. I don't think I've seen so many trails. Yeah. Let me know when you're ready for a DBL reset. Yep, you can do it. Okay. DPL is set. All right, Jake, you want to do the yep. camera dance? Lights on? What's happening here? Yeah, is that porch light? No porch light. Laser's off. So we're going by that view up there. Ah, uh, yeah. I forgot the 4K was put on that one. I'd have to go with porch yeah, lights. Porch lights? You want porch lights on? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Forget to uh, get enough light on that since uh, our light pool is way out these days. Okay, black balance first. Herc's going to black. And white balance. Jake, you slipped out. Actually, I think it's the pan. Huh? Is it centered up enough? It's good, yeah. Okay. It'll be all right. Okay, white balance complete, and save it. All right, all done, thank you. All right. <coughs> so All right, what's your plan of attack? All right. So we are going to be headed up towards this uh, steep slope, 
possibly a wall. Let's head zero five zero. That zero looks five good. Zero. And if the wall looks interesting, we'll try to lateral along it. For, oh, I don't know, maybe 50 meters or so, one direction. And Come back. Ready for our first move? Yep. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Bridge nav. Can we make a 20 meter move, zero five zero? Thanks. So what do we have down there making these trails? See cucumber off to the right? Yep, there's definitely a cuke over there. Is it up? Big one? <laughs> it's not as big as that other one that we saw. <laughs> oh, so chunky. It is a pretty chunky one. So this it's in the same family, it's the Cynalactidae. This one might take off. I, I see it kind of prepping for a a nice launch maneuver. Zoom in, Dan. <laughs> nice color, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the little ice pod. You see that little thing skitter? Yeah. Ooh. Oh, it's moving. Mm. Oh. Oh. oh, hello. Oh, and that's a scale worm, but no. it's much smaller than the one we saw last night. Do they harm them? No, they usually just like hang out. They'll like pick off parasites and stuff. Oh, oh so they're nice. Yeah. They're pretty chill. Give a little massage. Also, cucumbers aren't very tasty. <laughs> they don't really have much uh, deliciousness going for them. Take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Not speaking for personal experience. <laughs> I like these colors together. Good color combo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that iridescent purple, that scale worm. It's so great. Some long antennae. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Hello. It's doing its uh it's like scrunching upward, its upward facing dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like not sure if it wants to put in the effort to swim or not. It's too much effort. It's like uh, maybe, not sure. It might be fine. There's got to be a lot of cukes around here. Yeah. Look at all those trails. Are they all from cucumbers, or could they be from something else? Uh, they could be from uh, sea urchins. Scale worms? Maybe <laughs> some of those big ones. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> What's that little uh, white thing over there? Uh, hmm, a sponge, maybe. Or it could be a xenophyophore. What's that? Xenophyophores are protists. They're a single cellular organism that creates this really large test. Um, they're multinucleate, which means that even though they are one cell, they have lots of nucleuses inside that cell, which is pretty wild. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't typically yeah, see a sponge in the sediment. You do see sponges in sediment. Some. Yeah, sometimes. 
Oh, I think you're right about the Xenophyophore. Yeah. These Xenophyophores xenophyophor come in lots of uh, shapes and sizes. So this is like one of the shapes that's a plate-like shape, but some are like really crenulated or round. Oh, this one's like got three plates kind of coming together. So they're not technically animals. They're not in the Animalia kingdom. They're protists. Protista. Protista. Okay. Come on, stop it. That's good. Okay. I have a feeling we'll see a bunch of these along our way. They're not really moving yet. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like there are several of them sticking up. Bridge now. Can we make a 20 meter move, zero, 050? Zero? Thanks. Okay, thanks. All right, so um, Bridges let us know that we've got some wind and rain outside right now. Yeah, the wind's come back up. Yeah. About 25 so, knots. So they'll try to make that move? Or? Yeah, so they're having a little trouble making the moves, but um, sure. we we can take our time, I think, getting to the wall, and hopefully it will pass by the time we get there. We don't want to have too much crazy weather going on uh, <laughs> if this is a vertical wall. Let's see what that little mound is. Yeah, usually these mounds are associated with burrows, uh, possibly created by echiurins or spoonworms. There's something in a burrow there. Or yeah. something in the ditch. Zoom in, Dave. Is this sort of a darker patch of sediment? Yeah. So the burrow would be in the mound. Yeah, this looks like an older mound, so I don't know if anybody's home there. You'll also see things like spoke traces. It looks like little star patterns on the seafloor. And those are also created by spoon worms. There's a lot of burrowing worm-like creatures in the sediment here. I don't see a hole, though. Yeah, no. that's why I think it's an old one. So these, these mounds can persist a long time after the animals moved on. Okay. Thanks for the zoom. So Megan, someone's wondering if the food source here is just based on like marine snow and fallen material. That's correct. All the food that's getting down to the seafloor has come from the surface in the form of marine snow and organisms that are moving vertically through the water columns. So yeah, there is no light down here, so no photosynthesis. Um, there is no source for chemosynthesis the at this location. I think it might be an urchin. The star. Yeah. We just went over? Just yeah. went over, yeah. Oh, urchin, maybe. Star. Might be a little dusty here. There it is. Is that a brittle star? Yep, there's a brittle star off to the right as well. Zoom in, Dave. Oh yeah, urchin. Mm -hmm. It's very tiny. <laughs> Is 
very spiky. It is very spiky. Well, it might be a sedarid, a pencil urchin, but uh, I don't recognize this one immediately. That's a good shot of it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. There was also like a little light colored white thing. Just as you zoom out, it'll come into view in the upper right hand corner. Yeah, you see that little oh, like, yeah. discoloration with the shadow to the left Over of the there? lasers? Yeah. Oh. The other right hand corner. Are you talking about did this I say guy? right? Yeah. Ah, right, left, <laughs> left. <laughs> Pistis sedaris, that's a possible ID for for that urchin. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in. Okay. Oh, it's another, another xenophyophore. All right. Huh. Time it does. Yeah, they're all over the place. I thought it might be a sponge or something. What do these do? Um, I don't know. They just do. That. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really they do simply much. They exist. Uh, they exist. They they eat uh, detritus. It's a little particulate matter. <laughs> I definitely want to see something that's coming out of a burrow. That would be so That'd cool. That'd be cool. Corley and I saw a spoonworm on our watch the last time we were out, and that was amazing. That was cool. Oh, when they were tracked back, like yeah, and it's just like burrow. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Another brittle star. Yep. Are we using this 4K view here? It, it's Dan wanted it up operationally, but I know, but I hate it because right. I gotta <laughs> crick my neck up. I here can change it. it. Yeah, put it back to nobody's using it. I'm getting a crick in my neck looking up there. <laughs> Much better. Yeah, I might take a look at the still cam one from time to time, but I'm not using the 4K. Okay. How's that? Another urchin, more xenos. What's that fuzzy dark spot that went fuzzy off on the spot. on the actual right this time? <laughs> <laughs> How far is the fuzzy dark? Uh, just the bottom, when out, out of view, in the yeah. center. I gotta there back up? Oh, okay. And then there's a, right next to it is one of those examples of a spoke trace that I was talking about. Oh, right. Yeah, you see that? Where it's like... Yeah. Spoke trace? Yeah, it looks like spokes on a bike. Mm-hmm. So the animal lives in a burrow right there in the center, and it sends out its proboscis for feeding. Oh, that looks like a tube anemone in an actual tube <laughs> in the sediment. Tube anemone. So as you zoom in, do you know what character you're looking for? The inner uh, the tentacles, the uh, second uh, pair of tentacles. Yep, I definitely ring. see those. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the only way to collect something like this would be to try to core it, but sometimes their uh, their burrows, their tubes are deeper than our cores can go, so really? you might not wow. be able to capture them. Wow. Mm -hmm. You 
suck them out of there with the hose? <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> I, I wish. You'd probably just suck a bunch of sediment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, Dave. So there's your star shape, the starburst. That's as far as over as I can go. Yeah. And this one's an older one. Okay. It looks like the hole's closed up. Moving on. Moving on. Is there another one of those over on the left? A bigger one? This thing? Oh, a smoke trace? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's, that's a good spot. Someone's wondering if you could find these in the Atlantic. Oh, absolutely. Um, you can see these things all over the abyssal plain, uh, even in the Atlantic. Uh, that's actually, I think, where they were first described as spoke traces. Um, oh, I read a few papers that? about the abyssal plain over there. What's that? Yeah, it's it like a floater. Drifting, drifting by. Oh. Oh. Lost Sorry. in the dust. I think it's a sea come cucumber. On come on out. You do? Whoa, he's oh, no, it's yeah. fast. Hurry, come closer. Oh, yeah. Oh, so cute. <laughs> Very funny looking. It's a good swimmer. And he's going to have all the insides. Yep. Yeah, this one's Very definitely much better at the swimming. <laughs> Yes, that's an Ipneastes. <laughs> they're they're much more so they have this sort of uh, skirt that they use to flap and swim. Acts as sort of a uh, a paddle. Yeah. Or a flipper. Okay. I'm gonna make a mess trying to get there. Fridge now. Um, can we do another twenty meter move zero five zero? Thanks. Oh. You got numbers uh, coming up there, Jake. What? You got numbers coming up? Uh, yeah. What's that dark spot by the lasers? The line. Is that a fish? Could be a fish. Come in, Dave. Tripod Maybe fish? Tripod. Yeah, you're right. It sure is. Bum, ba, da, da. Oh, and it turned just for us. Mm -hmm. Good job, little friend. <laughs> I love the pattern of their scales. They've, oh, they've got I such a cool the color. Oh, yeah. This is a nice color. Yeah. yeah. Purplish. So this is Bathytera atraqualer, a tripod fish. They are related to the lizard fishes. They're ambush predators, so they just sort of sit and wait for their food to come to them. 
They use those modified pectoral fins in order to sense their things in their surroundings. What do so, they eat? Um, small crustaceans and other small things. Maybe scaleworms. This must be really fine sediment here. Yeah. It's easy to move. Oh, there's something flaily. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a worm. Yeah, it's definitely a worm. A worm like thing. It's kind of impressive how light and fluffy the sediment is at this depth. All right, moving on. Moving on. Yeah, it's going to take a while for sediment to clear here. Bridge now. I don't know. It looks like there is a current flowing, though. Can we do another 20 meter move, zero five zero? Thanks. Yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of mess for not making a mess. <laughs> <laughs> How big was that step? 20 meters. 20. Yeah, I thought we should take it slow until the weather started to clear, but it, it looks like winds are down to around 19 knots. That's good. Instead of what I was seeing gusts of over 27. Getting a lot of squalls today. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one of those days. Another sea cucumber. Look like it. That yeah, good eye. Was that is that a crinoid? Uh, I think it's another one of those urchins. Zoom in, Dave. And a sea cucumber? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> another one of those. Uh, Wait, it's kind of just floating, just floating there. Just there. Floating. <laughs> That's the way to move if around. If I don't move, they won't notice me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me kind of uncomfortable that I can see its inside. <laughs> yeah. That thing's got its Z bias locked in. Yeah. <laughs> Disturb his peace here. Yeah. They're really cool, oh. though. Is that its digestive tract and like sediment and stuff inside? That's exactly right. That's neat. <laughs> <laughs> Very weird. Yeah. 
He did not eat Oreos today. <laughs> Look at it go. <laughs> Bye. So graceful. So is it just like full of sand? Yep. Looks like it. <laughs> yep, they just they just eat the sand. Digest all that good organic material and you know poop up clean sand. Yeah, yeah, nice and clean. Wow, that is so weird. <laughs> They have brains. Um, they've got ganglia, like a little mass of cells, but they're not particularly intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you can uh, see through your brain, you know. Not deep <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. There it is. You ready, Jake? Uh, sure, let's do it. Bye. <laughs> Someone says that it's getting a full body workout with that swim. Yeah. Some ab crunches. Another urchin. Goes again. Oh, I'm switching. Yeah. All you. <laughs> you gotta zip ahead a bit. Yeah. Catch up. Get over to this wall. Yeah, I'm curious about it. We're getting there. Again, someone's wondering if the pelagic uh, cucumbers, Coming up. do they land? and Garage. Or do they spend most of their time in the water column? Um, so Ooh. things like that, ipneastes will, What's will land occasionally. But um, yeah, they spend most of their time in the water column. Big sea urchin. Then there's the Plagatheria anateatix, which we might see. That's also another um, purple sea cucumber that looks kind of octopus-like, hmm. um, but see-through like that. Zoom in there, and Dave. the that we we're just looking at, um, those spend all of their time in the water column. And if they do end up on something, it wasn't intentional. So this is a pancake urchin. <laughs> called Tromicosoma. So this is a urchin in the family Kynothuridae. They call them pancake urchins because uh, when they were first collected, Ooh. oh, it's moving. They have oh wow, yes, <laughs> super super fast. <laughs> oh, it's running oh, into the star. Floating. Uh. <laughs> Move the star. Yeah, so when they, they were first collected, uh, the, the test or the skeleton of the urchin is very thin. So it ended up collapsing, um, making it look very, very flat, giving up. it the name pancake. Yeah, you gotta zip when they were first seen alive, they're, they're not nearly as flat. They're like super fluffy pancakes. <laughs> hmm. mm, pancakes. I think tomorrow's pancake day. Oh, I hope we usually like alternate between pancakes and crepes. Mm. Oh, wow. what the? That was not <laughs> us. Did we do that? that? Where's that coming from? How, how did that get there? Is this our own gust front? Yeah. Oh, we're just chasing it. Wow. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fine. pretty fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> fine. Sediment. Wow. Park's going to need a good bath. So that's kind of a demonstration of what I was looking at in the satellite imagery. These squalls <laughs> pushing the clouds out in a, in a bow, in an arc. Ooh, that looks like a footprint almost. It does. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Bigfoot underwater. He has five toes. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. We're gonna get some. Yeah. <laughs> <You're very laughs> We're get that was what was walking around. <laughs> Made that dust plume. What Noah doesn't want you to know. <laughs> yeah. Humans pushed Bigfoot into the deep sea. <laughs> <laughs> that straight line there. That straight trail. Hmm. That one cucumber Someone, really was yeah, on a mission. He, he, wow, it knew where it wanted to go. <laughs> See, it, another it, footprint. It chose right a there. course and it stuck to it. <laughs> wow, that's a good navigator. Yeah. <laughs> Must not see your course. <laughs> It's still a long yeah. straight line, yeah, in pitch darkness. Mm -hmm. Good internal compass. tilts off because of the ground fault. Ah, right. How come it's so dark? <laughs> <laughs> mm. So, uh, fun fact about some of these trails and traces that we're seeing, uh, the name for it is Lebensspuren, which is uh, German it means life traces. Mm -hmm. And so mm. it's really just sort of like a fancy word for deep sea poop. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so you'll see uh, things like our, um, the Yoda worm the, uh, <laughs> that we saw a while back. It, it leaves really large trails behind it. Uh, our cucumbers will leave trails. And the trails and traces that we see can actually give us information about how much life is down here, even if we're not seeing animals right away, there's obviously lots of activity, especially mm -hmm. in this location that we're looking at. Um, and also these trails, they can last a long time because there isn't that much you know, current disturbance in these areas. So we can learn about what animals might be here passing through, even if we can only glimpse it a short period of time. One of like the weirdest things uh, Trace, we, we probably won't see at this depth, but we could see on uh, areas of the Bizzle Plains are these uh, paleodictions, uh, that's what they're called. They're like these hexagonal traces of dots, and no one knows what makes them. It's, it's a big mystery, and there are some people out there that are really interested in finding out what makes these, like, traces. They look kind of alien because they're very hexagonal and hmm. they, they don't look natural almost but uh, they have to be made by something probably an animal um, some say puffer fish they leave leave spur in um, when they build their nests uh, yeah. to impress a mate so like these beautiful sand structures that they create so it's not unfounded that you'd have um, an animal that creates such an interesting pattern in the sediment. But even in areas where you have sediment, it might look boring, but there's a ton of life down here. It's actually quite fascinating as you get a closer look. Mm. Also, don't look up paleodictyon if you have trypophobia. 
<laughs> they look really weird. <laughs> and holy. Yep, they're definitely lots of little little holes. What's that dark blotch? Uh, that's just a blotch of uh, phytodetritus. We need a good cucumber to get to that. Yeah, that's like nom central. <laughs> oh, this one made a U-turn. <laughs> Don't like this direction. <laughs> Bridge now. Left the tea kettle on. <laughs> Can we make a 40 meter move 050? Zero zero? Thanks. Someone says it looks like the desert floor with the desert floor with Jeep trails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does kind of look like that, doesn't it? We're just driving our sea cucumbers around in the deep sea. <laughs> vroom, vroom. Because some of them, like, if you look, you can see the, it does look like tire like tracks, tracks, you know? Yeah. The ripples. Yeah, uh, so that's what the scale worms are doing. They're like, ride them, cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Keep you up. Yeah, some people can like identify uh, animals based on the trails they leave. So like some fish will make distinctive looking trails that are wavy like that. Um, cucumbers make more straight or like meandering straight edged trails. So Megan, that uh, the worm I was talking about? Yeah. It's called a boot lace worm. <laughs> it says they can be up to 30 meters long and maybe oh the longest gosh. animal on the planet. Oh what? my goodness. <laughs> nope. That's amazing. Boot Don't lace? That. Oh, yeah. boot lace Don't Google worm. a picture of it. <laughs> I'm doing it. Don't. Like, do you already do it? What's I'm the diameter of this worm? Are like they like really level worm small size. skinny? Ooh. Or like... Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> It is uh, not attractive at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're expecting when it eats worms. Mm. I don't know. Sometimes worms are. I like earthworms. Like they do a lot for the earth, like for your garden. For yeah. Yeah. No, like they're good composters. They yeah. are good for your garden. Good for your plants. But like when they're 30 meters long, I'm just gonna say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why does it need to be that long? Like, <laughs> what is your purpose? Nope. <laughs> no. 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 Nope. <laughs> Lineus longissimus. <laughs> <laughs> they came up with suitable. Very We have a question on when did the dive start and how much longer are we going to be in the water for? Well, it just started. Um, we've been in the water for a little while, but we just got to the bottom uh, not that long ago. So we are at the beginning stages of seafloor time on this dive. But, um, Emil, how long do you expect this dive to go for? Till um, 1600 tomorrow. Let's see here. Hawaii time. Launched at 1800. So. Yeah, we'll make it a 22-hour dive, 1,600. Great. Although, if it looks like this for the whole dive, <laughs> uh, we might call it a little early. Oh, no, we're, we're getting close to our rocks. Yeah. We need uh, rocks. I got a sonar target. I'm, yeah. I'm headed towards. Crowley needs all the rock samples. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we expect to cross two terraces, <clears throat> so s steep steps on our way up the slope. And those should be interesting. There, we may also see some uh, volcanic cones. Hmm. I'm into that. So it says here that they may grow up to <laughs> 60 <laughs> meters long. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Longer than a blue whale. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. But why? For like what why? good reason? That's yeah. about the size of this ship. <laughs> <laughs> What's Ew. the purpose? <laughs> a nautilus sized worm. Can you imagine? <laughs> I don't want to imagine. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
But I just don't understand why you need to be that long. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. Well, he keeps it all wrapped up. Yeah, though. but uh, yeah, how do you know like, these things, Bob? How like do you know testing. this animal? <laughs> He's Googling it right now. <laughs> Did you just Google one day longest worm? <laughs> I, I forget how I found it. Like, how did you know? <laughs> Another one of those mounds. Yeah, a big one. Like little pyramids. Yanking me around, I think. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> kind of, you know, speed up the pace. Coralie, someone's wondering, what are you looking for in the rocks that we collect? Yeah, so um, the first thing that I'm looking for is ferromanganese crust, which is um, something that grows on top of a rock that's already there. So whatever substrate is there, um, these crusts form on top. They're hydrogenetic, which means they form out of the seawater, and um, they're composed mostly of iron and manganese uh, that attract oppositely charged uh, metal ions in the water and like lock them in place. Um, and they could be potentially large reservoirs for really important um, and economically valuable metals. Uh, so that's one thing. And then we're also looking for angular rocks uh, that we could possibly use for dating so that we can understand a little bit better the history of these seamounts. Um, so another one of the scientists on board, um, Amber Cervolo, is uh, looking at that. Thanks. Bob, someone wants you to know that bootlace worm toxin can kill cockroaches. The what? Oh. Can? The, the, the bootlace boot worms, oh, really? they're toxin. Apparently, someone says that they can kill cockroaches. Oh, they wanted nice. you to know. Oh. I'm totally oh. behind this one now. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Can I get one as a pet? <laughs> Oof. Nope. Still not going there, Jake. No. <laughs> How did somebody figure that out? I have no idea. <laughs> Very Couldn't carefully. <laughs> Couldn't tell you. Megan, someone's wondering about seafloor mapping. Um, they were question: is the seafloor mapping done with instruments on the boat or on the ROVs? Do you want to talk a bit about how we map on Nautilus? Yes, yeah, so all of our multi-beam sonars are mounted on the boat. So the boat will drive around, and uh, that's how we map, map our seafloor. Hey, a rock. Yep. Oh, we're getting to Sorry, really I cut you off. Stuff. Oh, here we are. <laughs> so that's well, the short, short be. version. Yeah, it looks like we're coming up on the wall here. Yep. Yep. All right. Getting there. Now we're going to see all that good corally stuff. <laughs> Not Coralie's stuff, but <laughs> maybe some <laughs> <of> Coralie's <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Hopefully. Now, Coralie, how do you know that this rock, like a rock is what you want? Like just by the color of it or? Um, so if it's uh, oh, nice this black color, we can kind of assume it's also pretty rounded. So like that rounder looking rock signals to me that that was a rock that's encoded in ferromanganese crust. But uh, we don't fully know what how thick the crust is or if it's a good rock until we get our hands on it and get it into the lab. What uh, coral were we looking at there? You want to look at it? That's a bathy pathies. Okay. Get a zoom, dude. Bridge now. That black skeleton. Mm. Hmm. 
Can we do a 20 meter move, zero, 050? Zero? Looks like it's been Thanks. preyed upon. It's missing some. It's missing some yeah, branches. Yeah, it's missing some stuff. And yep. then on that rock, there's a sea star. Yeah. Almost matches the color of the coral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it looks almost the same, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Pretty cool. Someone's wondering if, like, oh. because this rock sh like appeared so suddenly, is this where lava would have stopped flowing, or is it just no? Bridge? So actually, um, the the basement rock of all of the oceans is made of uh, volcanic rock, and that is basalt. So at mid-ocean ridges, they diverge, and you get pretty much uh, rock that's coming straight from the mantle. Um, at mid-ocean ridges and then is pushed to the sides. And then you can get seamounts from things like hotspot, which is what Hawaii is. Hawaii is a hotspot. Um, so, and different um, other volcanic provinces and stuff like that. Yeah. But no, so all of this, everything is basalt. And then on top of that, you can get other kinds of rocks that start to form. That's a nice rock there. Yeah. Uh, right could we there. sample something, maybe? Uh, sure. Are we still moving? That? Yeah, we that, are that right halfway there. through a move. Was it a 20 meter move? It was 20 meters. Okay. I just wanted to make sure Argus was catching up. Looks like a big rock. There's another really good black one behind it. This one? Yeah. Yeah. It's dark. Don't want to uh, threaten that coral up there. Are you like just trying to balance on the corner there or something? Is that all right? Well, not when you're grabbing a rock. I'm going to yard you right off of there. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we need to be kind of planted. Uh, Driving in when no, into when it. We're falling behind the times, too. I okay. think we got to look at something further up this slope. All right. Yeah. Yeah. These pretty all look pretty things. fixed. Yeah, I got to come up. Is that one of those militaris? Yeah, that's the Romilla Gorgia militaris. Up we go. That's so crazy. Just appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. A lot of sediment. Done. I feel like those Looks might like be too sedimented up yeah. there. <laughs> it's a little bit. Big. How do uh, yeah. one of these rocks look, Corley? These look a little bit too sedimented. So another. Looks like there's more up right ahead. Yeah. You can zip up. Get get out in front of the pack here. Samoa, we look for a good rock. Someone's wondering what the difference is between an atoll and an island. Coral atoll is uh, just that 
portion of the island that's still above water due to the growth of corals along the edges, the fringing reef around the island um, continues to grow up as the island sinks. And so what's left above water is just the coral and a, and a so lagoon in the middle. So this is an unbranched primnoid coral. Probably macro primnoa, I believe is the name. Good on this. Good. Yep. Okay. Oh, someone says that this is their favorite thing on the internet. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Could you we appreciate it. Pivot you. to That's the so right, nice. uh, Jake. See what's especially because you know, there's so dark many things on the internet. Is, yeah. Might be a loose. Oh yeah. Okay. I see. Rock. Kind of dark, maybe a bit big. Yeah, that's too big. Very big. Like there's an outcrop over there to the left, though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking these trails might probably persist a long time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yep. we'd see a lot more animals. Or maybe all the animals are just off screen and we can't yeah. see them. <laughs> you just never know. Like we might need another move to get to that. Yeah. Um, Outcrop. maybe it's 10 meters. Yeah. All right. Bridge now. Maybe to the north. This is some dark rock. Can we make a 10 meter move? Um, zero one zero. The goal is just finding something that's Thanks. in place and not attached. Yeah. Nice Loose and dark. rocks. Loose rocks. <laughs> Good little stars. Yeah. Yeah, can we do a quick zoom on it those stars? It looks like there's loose sure. in here. The uh, ones down low? Yeah. Yep. They just are so artfully arranged. Yeah. Zoom in, Dave. They really stand out against the dark mm -hmm. background. Yeah. Yeah, so these are definitely brittle stars. Yeah. I like their color. Mm -hmm. They have like some really long spines. On yeah, that one. Look at that yeah, one on like, the side. That's amazing. 
They're really pretty. And when you have enough tether, maybe we could also lateral over to the right a bit. It looks uh, look like maybe a loose rock. A star in the middle of the uh, circle. Yeah. It's cool. It's a perfect <laughs> star. <cute. laughs> Yeah, the way to identify a lot of these brittle stars is to look at their mouth parts. So, if we could get one to cooperate, <laughs> but that's unlikely. How do we get it to cooperate? I don't know. You just like ask it to turn over. <laughs> turn over. Please. Uh, uncooperative. <laughs> that wouldn't be very advantageous to the uh, brittle star. They wouldn't be able to hold on. Yeah, they're over it. So over to the right, look like maybe there's some pieces that fell down. Over here. A long legged. Yep. Mm. Oh, maybe. Hey, or don't be a spider. Don't be a spider. Don't be a spider. Don't be a spider. I don't know. I think the, the body's too fat for a sea spider. What do you think? But the way the legs are arranged makes it look like a sea spider. This could be attached, I don't know. But that one would be some bad. of these. Yeah. Ooh. Oh. Oh. What's it got? It's got yeah, something. Yeah, it's moving. What's I don't something? Know. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, yeah, it is a sea spider. It's a spider. <laughs> it's a big one. It's, oh, so, it's big. so big. <laughs> yeah, what does he have? Yeah. He's holding something. something? Well, they feed on cnidarians, so oh. it's probably oh. an anemone oh. of some sort. Hmm. And it, it basically wow, feeds like a, so weird. it has this proboscis, and it just sort of sucks out all that goodness. Like, look at it. Wow. It, all it is is legs. Neat. It <laughs> is. All of it's like... Where is its head? Does I don't it understand. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like most of its, its functions are in its legs. Yeah, right yeah. where it's holding that anemone there's that head. Yeah. And they have two <laughs> little like eye spots usually. Not a deep thinker. <laughs> yeah. Juice, juice. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are really crazy animals. Oh, they're yeah. so gross. <laughs> these are great. <laughs> I definitely prefer these spiders than mountain spiders. Really? Uh, better to look at. Well, yeah. the colors are prettier, but. Not the legs. Just <laughs> too fuzzy, the land spiders. Maybe in a million years it'll move from the ocean to land. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty oh. colors. I'll admit to that. Long legs. Alrighty. Let's look for some rocks. Yes. Let's lateral over and look at these fragments. Rocks. That's definitely got to be the fattest one I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> these ones over here? Yeah. Does it look good, these rocks? Ooh, that dark black one. Let's see. What that about maybe? that? Uh, too small. What about hey, that one? There you go. All right. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got the idea. <laughs> What are we going for? Sorry. Uh, we zoom in, Dave. Let's see what we got there. Please be unstuck. It's, it's kind of crusty. Bit sedimented. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yay. Nice. Let's take a look. What do you think? Uh, can we turn it around a couple times? Where's this one gonna go? Can do you forward, bow, box, A. 
if we decide to keep it? Yeah. What do you think, Coralie? Yeah, we might as well. Forward box A. Forward. Um. Oh, forward. Steve did say just sample like you <laughs> need to, so. <laughs> well, we can stick it in the side. Yeah, side. The starboard? Side, uh, starboard is uh, got those nice small okay. sure. boxes. Sure. Starboard, rock that. Is this uh, sample 40? Yes, sample 40. Those forward ones might be good for bio. All right, switching salvos. Megan, someone's wondering if the sea spiders, if you can tell female from male. Um, yeah, I think you can. Uh, you see the, the arms that they had uh, underneath the body. Where are we putting this? Uh, I, Starboard I don't know A. exactly how, but there's a difference between those, those uh, pairs of arms between males and females. It's looking pretty good. What depth is this? this While you're here, do you mind if I reset your DVL? Sure. Go ahead. a bit dusty. Fly about. So are we trying for regular depth intervals on these collections? Um, we can. Um, however, I think we are unsure of what we may find. So Steve has kind of given me free reign to choose as many rock samples as I can. I joked about collecting all 10 in, their next, in this next <laughs> hour. and. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think you would mind if I did, so. <laughs> yeah. You gotta be sure you get a good one. Yeah. There's a nice bamboo coral. Yeah. And what's the little orange thing? Or yeah, what's oh that yeah. yellow round? Little button. It's gonna be a bit dusty. I'm still in this big cloud I kicked up. Can we zoom from here? Can you zoom, Dave? Oh, it's an urchin. Huh. <laughs> well, it's pretty cute. Might be an irregular urchin. What's the difference? Um, well, regular urchins usually aren't very round, except this is a round irregular urchin, so that's, that's not a really good character. <laughs> <laughs> it almost looks like a ping pong ball, oh, yeah. but like covered in mm, green <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Five centimeters in diameter. Hmm. That's pretty cute. There's a <laughs> picture of one in the guide. Um, so they're in the Irregularia. 
And this could be um, a pilomatokinus. These have been seen in the Line Islands, um, American Samoa, Wake. So we're in that area where yeah. these have been observed. Yep, pilomatic. And what are their spines? Um, I believe they're made out of uh, carbonate. Pilomatic. Yeah. All right, satisfied with that zoom? There was something on the bamboo coral. You see that like sort of pink dot? Mm hmm. Yep. What's going on there? This? Yeah. Is that another area where it grew over? You know, it could be. It's very pink. Or it's just, yeah. It's it, maybe it's just a polyp and yeah. it was closed and it, the light shone just perfectly on yeah. it. <laughs> it got me. I was like, what's going on there? Oh, that's a great zoom though. Yeah. You can you can see the sclerites. Wow. Yeah, wow. That's so cool. Um, that yeah, is a great zoom. It has really long intertentacular spines, meaning that there are spines in between the tentacles of the polyp. And they're really long. It's a very 